I found out that I had a third job to do as ambassador from Lieberland to Smalliland. When the internet was out for all those days, I couldn't get any information in about what was going on. Before the internet came back on, I hired a satellite phone from some guy for like five bucks. And I called my girlfriend at the time and was like, hey, like what's going on? And she's like, are you okay? Like I heard about the cyclone. And I was like, what cyclone? And she's like, There's, there was a cyclone all throughout Somalia. I was like, what the f there was a cyclone? Next couple days, the internet clicks back on. I get a message and a call from the Secretary of State of Lieberland. And he's like, this actually works really well for us because we're gonna give aid and we're the only ones with the diplomatic team on the ground to give aid. And I was like, who's the team? And what do like, they even have? Hey guys, before we begin this podcast, can I ask you a small favor? So in the month of September, if you look at this chart to my right, if you're watching here on YouTube, you'll see that 84% of the watch time that we had on this channel was from people who were not subscribed. And so it's no coincidence that we started to have a big problem getting episodes successfully into the YouTube algorithm throughout September and October, despite the fact that they were performing well by almost every other metric. Frankly, it's because I have been remiss on asking you guys to subscribe to the channel, so that's on me. That said, if you don't mind, please take one second, hit that subscribe button here on YouTube so that we can grow this show, get great guests to come in here, and put out more podcasts. The bottom line is our show doesn't happen without help from all of you, so thank you to everyone who has been so supportive along the way, and please subscribe. All right, so Eric, for people who aren't familiar with you and your story, as a world traveler, <laughs> one of the many things you've done is you found yourself in the situation where you go to all these nation states that aren't even recognized by a lot of the world but are trying to draw their own borders and become places. Correct. So yeah. what happened? You you were in Lieberland and something happens, somebody dies, and the president asks you to be the official ambassador for Lieberland which you are not even a citizen of at this time, <laughs> to another unrecognized country that actually has a lot of people called Somaliland. Correct. Yeah. And, and, and I, where is Somaliland? I, it's the, the northern portion of the Horn of Africa. Um, okay. uh and I, I should say that I don't know uh, anything happened to the former ambassador. I just should have asked, um, and I didn't, because <laughs> I just needed some place to stay in Somaliland. Um and so, yeah, I uh, I agreed to become the ambassador from Lieberland to Somaliland. And then I was I said, you know, what do I have to do <laughs> as that? Well, first, I just confirmed that I could indeed stay at the embassy. And he's like, yeah, but it's also empty. We'll see if we can put a bed in there for you. <laughs> and I was like... Does it have electricity? It, it, it did. Running water? It did. No, it did not have running water. Um, no. Yeah. So... Uh, With a towel or some shit? Uh, I, I showered out of a, a water bottle. It's, oh. uh, they, I, I detail how to do that in the book, too. Um, any, What's uh, the name of your book? You Are Not you Here? You Are Not Here travels through countries that don't exist and uh this is the fifth po the, the fifth segment of the book the fifth chapter is when i end up in somaliland as the ambassador from <laughs> from Lieberland. um so and also any any good peace corps volunteer knows how to how to shower out of a water bottle mm. really well yeah I'm stellar at it uh so anyway uh, i i'm talking with the with the secretary of state at this point and i'm like what what do i have to do what do i need to do as an ambassador <laughs> and he's like well uh you have to buy furniture for the embassy because it's like we said it's empty and i was like fine okay i can figure out how to buy furniture <laughs> in somaliland ikea during ramadan which makes it even harder um yeah they don't have an ikea there unfortunately <laughs> yet yet it's a it's a blue water market for for ikea i think <sighs> <sighs> and um, oh then he's like, the second job is you need to um, uh, establish diplomatic and political ties between Lieberland and Somaliland. Oh, yeah. Sure, sure thing. No I was problem. Like, done. <laughs> yeah. I've all done that before so many times. <laughs> and I should say, I've never even bought furniture before. Like, the furniture <sighs> that I, I had previously was like, like a dumpster dived couch from some place in in uh, in Los Angeles, uh, and, and you know an ancient uh, uh, bed 
like an ancient mattress that was on the floor. Like, uh, I wasn't doing great, let's say. Yeah. Um, so I'd never bought furniture before, um, but I also had never been an ambassador before, and and I'm just I'm just out here saying yes to life. And this is in 2018. 2018, correct. So um, I get to Hargiza. Uh, I land in in Hargiza. And I'm told that I'm going to have a contact out there, uh, and that contact is the attache to the UAE f- on behalf of Liberland. So he has mm. some relationship with Liberland, and he is uh, he's an engineer working in uh, Somaliland. That's all I know about him. And I also know that he's Syrian. Okay. I'm like, cool. Um, so show up. Um, it's really easy to tell who's not from Somaliland uh, as soon as you get out and people knew they could tell that I wasn't a local. <laughs> I, was, I was shocked. I was like, wow, I thought I was blending in so well. Um, and so I saw, I saw, you know, that my contact, I think everyone can use their imagination. This, right, and fill it, that one in. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, uh, I, I saw my contact and he's like, Oh, Hey, and I, I knew he was Syrian. So I was like, Shlonak, which is like, I guess the, the like Syrian version of what's up in Arabic. And he's like, you're a CIA agent. And I'm like, I, this is going so bad. It's not going well immediately. <laughs> Everybody seems to think I'm more competent Ooh. than I am. <laughs> you're a perfect plant perfect little plant talk about like i'm the most useful idiot i am the i am the swiss army knife of idiots so anyway uh i i go with him to his office and um he's like look i'll be your uh uh your sort of virgil and help guide you through through all the the um machinations of somaliland I'm going to set you up with different contacts here, and then they'll help you do whatever you need to do. Um, and then I'm leaving for Ramadan because it's boring here uh, during Ramadan. And have a good time. And I was like, okay, cool. And he introduced me to a, a wonderful guy named uh, Abdul Rahman. And um, I'm sorry. I kind of asked this already, but I'm, I'm putting the screenshot of the map in the corner of the yeah. screen again. This is Somalia. Yeah, and this right here is Somaliland. Yeah, so the the entire horn currently the uh, currently as far as the world is concerned, the entire horn is Somalia, Somalia. is federal Somalia. However, there are uh, two indep- active independence movements. One is in Somaliland with its uh, government in Hargeisa, and then the other one is uh, in a place called Puntland. And that's um, depending on who you ask. I mean, you know, these borders are always depending on who you ask um but puntland is um towards the tip of the horn um somaliland is uh it it was also the sort of british protectorate back in the day um okay so uh during the great uh i think it was called the historically it was called the scramble for africa uh, the Italians and the British were were really keen on on fighting over uh, Somalia, and uh, for the most part, uh, the Horn of Africa was. What years was this again? Oh, the scramble for Africa. I have it in my book. All right, I'll, I'll look it up. <laughs> I, yeah, yeah, look it up. I I want to. Ooh, let me see if I'm right though. Uh, I want to say it's like the the 30s. It's like 30s. Taking a look. Eight, the scramble for Africa began in the 1880s. Not even close, by, man. I, by 1914, the only African countries not controlled by European power were Liberia and Ethiopia. Ethiopia. Yep. Mm-hmm. Okay. So uh, the Italians came in. They they took over large portions of Somalia. Uh, the British also fought them for that. Um, and uh, the previously, so uh, Somali land was previously a, a British protectorate. And then, as they, um, uh, as the British withdrew, and you know, but did of, they call it some? Did did the British refer to it as yeah, Somalia? Correct, Somali land. Correct. Yeah, interesting. Okay. And so, um, as the British began withdrawing from, you know, the the business of colonization, uh, like like some cool guys, uh, Somali land existed as this independent area for i think it was only a couple of days before deciding to merge with the rest of federal somalia 
or what we now know as as what the globe shows us is Somalia. And you said that there's different languages that are spoken across here. There's and- different tribes. Uh, Somali, as far as I know, is spoken is spoken very widely in the large swath of area which which Somali people, uh, uh, you know, uh, are are. Uh, uh, like live in because it's remember like Somali culture is is uh, like there is a large nomadic portion and pastoralist portion of of Somali culture so uh, there are active nomads and pastoralists who mm. travel from the Horn of Africa all the way up to Kenya uh, to Djibouti uh, and so they themselves are a bit of of borderless individuals Got it. Um, and this this became pretty important as I was, um, as I was working on my, you know, my two goals, uh, you know, buy furniture and establish diplomatic connections with <laughs> <laughs> between Liberland and Somaliland, um, I was able to meet uh, the vice president, and that was cool. It's, I have a, a picture of that on my my uh, Instagram. If you uh, want to take a look at that, I'll it's put uh, your Instagram behind yeah, yeah. here so you can help me point it out. Yeah. So this was scroll up a little more. Yeah. Up a little bit more. Oh, stop there. Yeah, this one right here. Okay. Okay, so... God, you look like a fed. Uh, <laughs> so I'm the one wearing the white shirt here. Yeah, no shit, Sherlock. I, I have the glasses on. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, I met I met the vice president of Somaliland. And um, so I, I should say at this point, I was really kind of fascinated, but also weirdly disappointed in myself because as soon as I like got in this... Aff- official capacity even though i was just on the right jet ski at the right time um i started talking like a politician like i just started thinking about the things that a politician (laughs) would say and i was like we at liberland believe in (laughs) self-determination of nations and we share that we would like to extend to you uh brotherhood uh, like i was just saying nonsense and it took nothing it just took somebody to call me mr ambassador one time <laughs> and suddenly i was so full of sh- <laughs> i was like where did i learn to talk like that i was like well oh, we are somewhere we at liberland feel that there's a, a shared a shared fight for for self-determination and and recognition amongst the globe Dude, you are a Judd Apatow movie. <laughs> you are Somebody a tell living him, embodiment, I'm super, embodiment super of a Judd Apatow right movie. Now. <laughs> <laughs> like, tell either Judd Apatow or, or the CIA, I don't care who employs me, I just need a job. Hey, we know we know a few people. Mm. Yeah, let me know. I'm, I'm happy to take a lie detector test. Oh my um, god. Yeah, no, no, keep okay. going. I'm just, I'm so, just like... anyway... Um, well, yeah, I, I otherwise I'm just like you know meeting people and and getting into trouble in in Somaliland and and then communications go out in the country for like a week, um and I was like that's strange, uh and and it's kind of unnerving and and a bit dangerous because obviously I'm I'm communicating with the folks at Liberland I'm communicating with my family um I had a, had a girlfriend at the time in Bulgaria so. Like I need to let people know I'm alive, and there was no internet anywhere. I go to the the um, sort of main hotel there. It's called the Ambassador Hotel, ironically. Um, of course, it is. And, and that's a that's a crazy hotel. You you meet some 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 quiet Americans at that hotel, and I'm clearly not one of them. What do you mean, quiet Americans? Meaning that that they're people who are there for very clear purposes, and then there are pe- and people who are there for, for purposes which might be involved in either warfare or ca- cowboy capitalism, is what I would say. Mm. So either they are uh, military contractors uh, doing God knows what. Uh, I, I usually wouldn't chat with those guys. Uh, and they don't really want to chat. But then you'd also meet like NGO workers who are doing interesting projects. And then you would meet like just totally random dudes. Like the one guy, uh, uh, shout out to Robbie. Um, uh, <laughs> this story didn't make it in the book, but it, just because it's so random. Like, so I go into the Ambassador Hotel one day. And um, there's an, an, another uh, blonde American guy who's just there. And he sees me, 
and you know clearly i i also am a bit of fish out of water and and uh, he's sitting with a chinese guy and he's sitting with a, a african-american guy and uh, he's like do you want to have coffee with us and i was like okay of course yeah yeah that sounds great like strangers I'm not doing anything else with my time um <laughs> still have no idea how to buy furniture that's all i'm thinking about today so i sit down across from him and i meet robbie um he is uh so a uh, former military uh, marine uh, that ended up meeting uh, his friend, Bishop Anthony, uh, who is a preacher in San Diego, California. Mind you, that's why they're there. They're, mm. they're buddies. And Robbie is, uh, he is, I would say, sort of a cowboy capitalist. Like, he's going into... Uh, blue water markets, uh, sometimes markets that either are totally untouched because they have weird regulatory issues or just because there's been conflict there recently. So he can be the only game in town. And he does large scale manufacturing. He wants to sell cell phones in in uh, uh, Somaliland. Hmm. And then next to him is a Chinese guy named David. And I was like, what's up with David? And then he's like, oh, well, David, uh, he studies uh, poetry and philosophy in Ethiopia, and he only speaks uh, Mandarin and uh, and Amharic. I'm like, and what? Amharic is the language of, of Ethiopia. And I was like, that's... And hmm. so, like, Robbie and David can, like, speak together. Um, and I'm like, what are you guys doing here? And then they're like, what are you doing here? I'm like, <laughs> I mean, I guess it's fair. Yeah, we both... It's, we're just a bunch of weird guys doing weird stuff in Somaliland, huh? <laughs> that's just that's the that's the four of us weird guys table over here. And so I I tell Robbie about Lieberland, and he's super into it, and he's like, "So how can I become a citizen?" I'm like, "I mean, go to our website." <laughs> <laughs> Is there like a join here button? Yeah. Oh my god. Absolutely. Oh my God! I mean, I and I also feel like I, I mean, I, this is far too far too late for me to uh, uh, lodge this complaint, but I feel like I should have gotten some kind of kickback for like getting Robbie to be a citizen. Like it should, uh, like I should have gotten like ten percent of his citizenship or something. What? Yeah, I just feel like I ten I, percent. I How does that? You know, mean, I told him about it. Maybe I should have gotten gotten some more Liberlandian merits for making a new Liberlander. But aren't didn't they weren't making they still weren't making you a citizen at this point? Mm, no, no, I was still not a citizen. I'm still not a citizen. Is that just because you didn't ask? Probably. Yeah. So yeah. What, but you wanted ten. How do you I get ten percent of someone's? Wanted more Liber, Liberland merits. You have to pay five thousand dollars to become a Liberland citizen. Oh, there and is then, a cost. Yeah. There's a real join here cost. And, and then you and then you get paid back in Liberlandian merits. In in what? Liberlandian merits. The f is that? I don't know, but I got six thousand of them. Yup. From my work as an ambassador. Still think I'm CIA? <laughs> yes. Yes, I do. <laughs> so anyway, Robbie is like, um Yeah, I'm sorry. Like, and his passport was like as thick as my thumb. I mean, it was insane. And he had been everywhere. Like, he was like, I have a factory in Da Hook outside what? of... Da Hook is like a, a city on the border of Turkey and Kurdistan. What um, a name. Yeah. That's off the hook. Da Hook. Yeah. <laughs> That's off the hook. That's good. Listen, if there's Kurdish rappers out there, take it. It needs to exist. Um, okay. Off the hook. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah, everywhere that I... He told me that he had, uh, like, he was one of the primary umbrella importers to North Korea. He's the guy who told me about the Isle of Quiche, which previous, and he's like, yeah, I've been to Iran a lot. It's great. Anyway, the Isle of Quiche. Quiche, it's, a, um, it's an island that's a free economic zone off of the coast of Iran. So, like, if you want to go to Iran as an American, you can just go to the Isle of Quiche. Are you sick of the coffee jitters from drinking it too many days in a row? How about that dreaded afternoon crash? Well then listen up, because I have an amazing on-the-go drink for you to try. Mudwater. Mudwater is a coffee alternative containing four adaptogenic mushrooms. Big words, because they're really cool. With only a fraction of the caffeine of a cup of coffee, you're still going to get that all-day energy without the jitters or the crash. And by the way, each ingredient was added for a very specific purpose. You got cacao and chai for a hint of caffeine and a tasty hot chocolate like flavor, cordyceps to promote natural energy, and both chaga and reishi to support a healthy immune system. All you gotta do is take a scoop of mud water powder, drop it into 
hot water, stir, and get on with your day. Personally, I love how you can drink mud water straight up or mix it into your favorite smoothie. Gotta have options, baby. So what I need you to do is go down and click the mud water link in my description and at checkout use promo code Julian to get 15% off the best coffee alternative you'll ever find. Once again, that's promo code Julian, J-U-L-I-A-N, at checkout to get 15% off your own mud water today. And by the way, they're going to throw in a free frother as well. Everybody wins. Now let's get back to the show. How do you spell quiche? K-I-S-H, I think. Quiche Iran? Yep. I'll just start with that. I got to pull this over here. Yep, there it is. Son of a bitch. I know. Isn't that... Where is this on a map? Uh, Persian Gulf. No way. Robbie knows all, man. Dude. Yeah. Yo, this is a little too dangerously close to Iran for me, but like, it is this Iran. looks beautiful. It, lit- it literally is. But it's an economic free zone. Correct. And the, and the Ayatollah lets this happen? Got me. <laughs> I, I'm I'm barely an expert in Lieberland. The Isle of Quiche was just some place that Robbie told me about. And people just live here. They live there and they do business there. So what it's does like, their passport say? Iran. If they if they're from there, then yeah, yeah. I mean, look, there's a free economic zone between uh, North Korea and South Korea. Like there are North Korean workers, I believe that work in factories that benefit South Korea. Dude, even when you think you know a little bit about the world, Yo. right? And let mm-hmm. me highlight how I think I know a little bit. Yup. You then have conversations like this, and you're like, you know fucking nothing. It is so liberating to embrace feeling dumb. Yes. It's so liberating. I so agree, man. It's like... That's why I, I do a podcast. God damn right. Yeah, yeah. well done. Well done yeah. on that. Yeah, cheers. I mean... I have no water in this yeah, new well, one right here, but we'll it's go the, with it. That's the symbol that matters. I keep the one down below deck, you know? Mm-hmm. But, wow. No, but like, so So anyway, he's, we he's just... We talking about quiche. I he's got you just off topic. dropping this knowledge on me, and, and I, places I've never heard about, like, you can speak Chinese and also Swedish, and you also are in Somaliland for some reason... Uh, Bishop Anthony is a random Baptist reverend. What's happening here? What is going on? And he's like, yeah, we're starting this cell phone business. And and then um, uh, and he was like, we're going to go to Berbera Port tomorrow. Do you want to go with us? And I was like, I mean, I'd love to go to Berbera because the, the port city in, in Somaliland. And um, I, I said I'd love to go, but I don't have enough money for armed guards because you, you have to pay for armed guards if you leave Hargiza. Uh, and Why? It, they just make foreigners do it. Uh, and there's, you know, you can get real fucked up out there. They they have dissident groups. They have... Uh, Still within Somaliland. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and there's there's very what, little... Well, what, what's the... I'm, I'm sorry to cut you off. I, I just want to know details. What's the terrain like? Once you go outside Hargiza, are yeah. you going into open desert, yeah. little villages, or rocky desert with, um, uh, uh, yeah, rocky desert, lots of horizon, um, not not desert like you think of the Sahara yes. with sort of like rolling sand dunes. Think like the land before time mixed with Dr. Seuss. <laughs> <laughs> like we explain the dr seuss part weird trees that look like they might talk uh um you know jagged mountains that kind of like like jut up oh so no, ja- jagged mountains that that uh sort of jut up into the sky uh really like rocky outcrops that that sort of descend into what are called wadis or these uh dry river beds and that's the since there's no roads, really, that's how you you travel through the country is you drive on these dry riverbeds called wadis. Mm. Um, bunch of damn, uh, I think they're, uh, I, I might be wrong, but I think they're baboons. Some kind of ape uh, is just like running around through underbrush all the time. You see them on the roads, horrifying looking things. But you said there's all kinds of horizon. This is so weird. Yeah, no, it's, about. it's, and it's, and you have to understand how much of it there is it's huge right like i never i never quite realized like how vast the horn of africa is um and berbera is maybe about two three hours from hargiza and, and how are you getting there 
Uh, so we're we're taking um, a uh, four by four with armed guards, uh, oh. and so we all pile in. Uh, we have we have an armed guard driving the car, and then we have another uh, four by four behind us as a follow car, and just like dudes with AK forty sevens that we rented. And what? How much did the armed guard cost? I want to say it was like. I mean, it's not much. Like, I think it was like two hundred fifty dollars a day, maybe per guard. Um, but like, is he good? Is he like? They didn't. She did anything for us, fortunately. Um, yeah, I mean, they they were nice. Huh? Okay. Yeah, I mean, it's I, not really the first trade I'm looking for in my armed guard. Yeah. But okay. I mean, they 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 held guns and rode along with us, so they didn't they didn't do too much. But anyway, we like we go out to. Um, uh you know we see some caves like literally we're just like sightseeing together with like me this like random chinese guy who speaks amharic robbie and this this baptist preacher (laughs) what a crew i oh oh, weirdest road trip i've ever been on trying to think what and i just keep going keep going i'm I'm, I'm, I'm gonna keep percolating and since i'm since i'm the new one like since i'm the one who like you know i mean they invited me but like i felt like i invited myself um, I'm like, don't worry, I'll take the center seat. <laughs> so I'm just like in between uh, Bishop Anthony and uh, and oh, Robbie. did you unplug that? You good? Yeah, yeah. Sorry. And I'm just like clutched in between them. And actually, B- Bishop Anthony was in the front seat, uh, and uh, and David was next to me. So I-, I can't talk to David at all because I don't speak any languages that he speaks. So it's just like he and I are just sort of exchanging thumbs up every once in a while. <laughs> And then we'd like get out and look at some cave paintings and be like, wow, look at these cave paintings in the middle of this desert. <sighs> and there's like a little like museum there. And we'd be like, nice. Well, what do you mean there's a little museum? Little there? hut. Little little museum hut. hut. Yeah. Just in the middle of nowhere. And just there's little cave paintings. Yeah, I can't remember. I think they're they're called the something Giel cave paintings. They're super old. They're like 7,000 years old. Um it really I, oh I've got a picture of it in my in my Instagram if you look at oh that. shit okay go down go down yeah is before the vice president picture uh, yeah there it is that's David <laughs> no shit yeah what's on these I can't really see what that is it's like um, put the picture in the it's a bunch of, screen, of like but... cows and uh, uh, and wildlife interesting okay. I I want to say I want to say some of them are like the cows banging too. Now, what's the cultural significance of cows fucking? Don't know. Uh, I, I I think that the the meaning of of these cave paintings are are lost. It's yeah. Do we know when they're from? I want to say it was like something like seven thousand years. Like they're very very old. Seven thousand. No, yeah. that's interesting. Yeah, yeah, super super. That's old. an interesting number. Mm-hmm. And they're and how are they carved? Like they're carved into it, or is it like drawn with something? I have no idea. the The guy who was like the the docent of the, uh, like the guy who showed us around. There's a picture of him down. Um, but the guy who showed us around was yeah that guy that guy with a stick. He only spoke I'll put Somali. Him in the corner of the screen. He Actually, only smokes. He only spoke Somali. Yeah, so like we we got very few questions answered by it. We knew that that they were discovered by like some French archaeologists. They, they didn't give you like a tran, trans. Oh, I'm gonna come back to that in a second. They didn't give you like a translator or something. No, no, we were just out there. <laughs> okay, well, we had plenty of guards. <laughs> we didn't. Where were these people? Okay, that's different. Yeah, yeah no, the yeah, Dogon. Yeah, 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 I think yeah, the Dogon yeah. people were I was say, it's not ethnically Somali, yeah. Mal, from Mali. Yes, that's fascinating. Right. That's fascinating right. people. Something about these French fucking archaeologists and the French researchers. They're just they're out there. Shit. Yeah, they're just out there being being French people. Yeah, I guess until they find some old shit and they're like, "This was okay." God, so did weird. you see the cave paintings? The fucking cows are fucking. Um, yeah. So then we continued on to Berbera Port. And the Red Sea, and you see any sharks out there? Mm-mm. No, mm-hmm. we saw some some kids playing in it. It's hot as fuck out there. I think it's the hottest I've ever I've now, ever is experienced. Now humid hot, humid like, hot, oh. humid hot. And so Robbie and I just like rolled up our our little pants and like stood in the Red Sea, and we we're like, we did it. And we went for lunch, and uh, then they dropped me off back at the hotel, and. Never saw them again. And again, this is an unrecognized country, but they're autonomous around here. Yeah, Somalia, and they have their own military force too. Did, did you did you say they pay taxes to Somalia? 
That I p- would not believe. I don't think that they would. Um, so how are they not recognized? Uh, so they are, in fact, you might, if you have Somali listeners, like, because I, I wrote an article. We have a few. Yeah. yeah. I wrote an article a couple of years ago where, actually, it was about Robbie. Um, and it was, uh, I was just saying that, you know, people are investing in Somaliland, right? That is a pretty, pretty milk toast article. And I got people like sliding in my DMs with like death threats just for even talking about Somaliland. And I was like, Jesus, like, uh, this is the. So Somalians sliding into your DM. Uh, whoever it was, I, I mean, you know, they didn't identify themselves, but they were like, hey, don't talk about Somaliland. Um, but isn't all they would really have to do? And this is probably such a, such a dumb point, but I still got to bring it up. Yeah, isn't, yeah. Technically, all they would have to do. Well, first of all, what's their what's their main resource? What's their main economic driver income opportunity? Yeah. Mm, uh, minerals. Minerals are huge there. What what minerals? Cobalt stuff like that. I I've heard different things, and I know that there's a lot of people looking into uh, uh, mineral extraction in northern Somalia. Okay, um, Somalia or Somali land? Uh, Somali land. All okay. I'm I'm pretty much always going to be speaking about Somali land. So but... isn't all they'd have to do is play like fantasy draft power countries and pick out any one of say the top ten GDP drivers in the world and say we're going to make a deal with you for minerals, and then that place, depending on who it is, mm-hmm. now if it's like just a European country, they got to. Go through the EU and yeah. shit like that, so it diff- it's difficult. But if it were like the U.S., yeah, or if it were Russia, or it were China, if one of those countries just said "fuck yeah, we got you," let's do some trade, fam. Well, look, and I then mean, they recognized it. Isn't that the, a big enough domino that money talks, and then potentially they're actually recognized as a bordered country? Yep, but that would also trigger a war with federal Somalia. And are they even there though? Yeah, oh, they yeah. are. And and there is no love lost between these two countries. So, but they, they're in their country. They are. There's a there's a sort of demilitarized strip of desert between them. I asked I asked somebody at one point like, would you ever fly or would you ever drive from, you know, Hargeisa to Mogadishu? And they just started laughing. They're like, that if you want to get killed, yeah, that's exactly what you would do. And Somalia, I mean, to be clear, not to be like crass, but it's a shit show. It is a, uh, there are, uh, it is not a very powerful central government and there is it's constant, a shit show. yeah, constant Pirates, violence. Pirates, terrorists, everything. Mm, you yeah. know, it's poverty stricken. Well, this, this is something I touch on in the book too, which is this, this idea of like, you know, the failed state, right? So like when you think about that, oftentimes Somalia is brought up as like this, um, uh, the, the, uh poster child for a failed state but ultimately you have to take a step back from what that term means most generously a failed state is a place where the central government has lost the trust of its people for whatever reason and is no longer able to collect taxes and provide services to its citizenry moreover they have broken that ability to generate consent amongst the governed, right? That's yes. the whole statehood thing. So what happens then is you have this large centralized power vacuum, and so power decentralizes to strongmen, and the regional strongmen fight over power, uh, and usually they're they're breaking down along either sectarian lines or the lines of, of business interests. Part of the reason that Somaliland is um, a a more stable portion of the Horn of Africa is because there's less clan diversity there. So the Isak tribe is the dominant power in Somaliland, right? And then I think there are are like uh, a couple of others. There's, I want to say, over 30 dominant clans in federal Somalia. Mm. So you have more of a power structure or you have more interests in fighting over power than you do in northern Somalia. So um, back in the, uh, or pardon me, in Somaliland. So back in the day, one of the reasons that uh, this, that there was conflict between Hargeisa and Mogadishu was because uh, Said Barre, their their dictator, saw the Isak tribe as a problem for him. Um, there's a 
bunch of reasons why he might have found that to be the case, but for whatever reason, the Isak were the the people that he had the biggest bone to pick with. Mm. And so he even, I think he even couched it in the terms, we're going to solve the Isak problem. And so this led him to uh, creating a, a genocide in northern Somalia, in Somaliland. Mm. So to this day, you can see uh, there's a, um, I think it's in my, um, you can see in Freedom Square, there's a, should be a picture of a MiG, a MiG jet, uh, maybe up maybe actually down probably oh yeah up up sorry um up a little bit more yeah so this this jet oh, shit. yeah but now if you click on it notice th this is something that i think is, I'll is put this in the corner of the screen yeah this is something it's sort of I, I think important to notice right so um traditionally when you're looking at municipal statues uh, there's a certain heroism, there's a certain glory, there's a certain marble feel to it, right? It's removed from the past. It makes the, the horrors of war seem glorious and righteous. This statue is about the bombing of Hargiza, the leveling of Hargiza mm. in, the, in the, the 80s by these MiG jets, right? And if you look at the, the bottom here, you literally see the scene of a battle. It's oh, somebody shit. walking through, shooting an AK-47 in the air. You see a man directly next to the other person with no hands. This is a monument unlike you would ever see in the world because the history is so fresh. It was such an eth I, well, I, I wouldn't maybe it's not an ethnic cleansing, but it was such a genocide against the Isak. Yeah, this is like. And that's why it's Hargi not celebrating it, but it's remembering it with the visuals of the that's bad right. that happened. Yeah, and that's why it's Har like having a Holocaust statue where it's showing the gas chamber. Exactly, and that's why Hargiza is known as the Dresden of Africa, is because it was absolutely leveled. Oh my God! Mm -hmm. Nineteen eighty-eight. Yep. Um, and and so yeah, that's that's uh, that's why. Um, you know there is there's no love lost between between Mogadishu and Hargiza uh and even though Hargiza is is in many ways more stable than Mogadishu Mogadishu is the recognized capital of Somalia whereas Hargiza remains unrecognized and it's in yeah right so this becomes incredibly difficult when you're talking about giving aid right so how do you how do you give aid when money has to go through Mogadishu or when organizations are... It'll never get there. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. So this brings me to what happened next uh, in uh, uh, Hargiza while I was living there. I found out that I had a third job to do as ambassador from Lieberland to Somaliland. Um, when the internet was out for all of those days, I couldn't get any information in about what was going on. And then finally the internet came back on, um, or no, before the internet came back on, I, I just like hired somebody, uh, I hired a satellite phone from some guy for like five bucks. And I called my girlfriend at the time and, and uh, was like, hey, like what's going on? And she's like, uh, you know, it's pretty crackly online. She's like, I th are you okay? Like I heard about the cyclone. And I was like, what cyclone? He's, she's like, there was, there was a cyclone all throughout Somalia. And I'm like, I'm okay. Just you know, tell my parents I'm good. Um, <laughs> like, you know, I, I had I had one choice, like either call my mom or call my girlfriend. And I was like, my girlfriend has my mom's number, so I'll, I'll call her. <laughs> 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 just just let her know I'm good. Uh, and then so I heard about the cyclone, and I was like, what the fuck? There was a cyclone. And next couple of days, the internet clicks back on. I get a message and, and a call from the Secretary of State of Lieberland. Oh, he's back. He's back. Hmm. And he's like, uh, are "How's you, it going? Are you okay? What's going on?" <laughs> and he's, I'm like, "I'm good. Like, I didn't, didn't even know there was a cyclone." And he's like, "Well, it was Cyclone Sagar was pretty bad, and uh, this actually works really well for us because we're gonna give aid, and we're the only ones with the diplomatic team on the ground to give aid." And I was like, "Who's the team?" And what he's do like, they even have? No, I know, but what kind of <laughs> aid do they have besides you just being on the ground there? Like, hello, that we was, at Lieberland believe in. Yeah, that was that's it. the aid. That was the aid. They're, we're here for moral support. And basically, <laughs> they were like, figure out how to do it. 
just figure out how to give aid. And I was like, okay. You got it. <laughs> no problem. I'm, I'm, a, I'm so good at this. <laughs> <laughs> Former Peace Corps volunteer. Have you heard about any wars coming out of Albania <laughs> recently? No. You're welcome for my oh service. Oh, my God. So then I had this third job. And fortunately, my my dear friend uh, uh, who's who's passed recently, uh, Abdul Rahman, I I contacted him, and he said, "Okay, well, you know, we'll we'll figure this out. We'll we'll figure out something. You just need to get money from from Lieberland, and then we'll we'll figure out how to give aid. Get like, some fucking Lieber coin. <laughs> well, so I try. I opened a bank account, f- which now when you open a bank account, are you saying I'm like? I, representing Lieberland? I walked into a bank in Hargeza, Somaliland, and I said, hello, I am the ambassador. <laughs> Sir, I am the ambassador from Lieberland to Somaliland, oh and I would like to make Dobshi Bank the official bank of Lieberland. The look that this guy gave, I think I made his whole fucking week. He thought that was the funniest shit he'd ever heard. <laughs> and then he was like, I need you to go to the office next door and find the guy with the biggest desk and tell him exactly <laughs> what you just told me. And I was like, I will. <laughs> so I go in and I... I can't believe you didn't get taken away by some guards and tortured in a bottom room in a basement somewhere that no I, one even knows exists. I'm so glad that never happened, man. Yeah, you were oh, like this close a, so damn, many times. Oh, yeah. Well, I, two two times get, get close in the book. Um... So anyway, I go to the guy with the biggest desk, and I'm like, hello! <laughs> it, it is I, the ambassador. And and eventually he's like, look, we can give you an account, um, but you can only put $1,000 in it. And I was like... I Dollars deem, are good. I deem this acceptable. <laughs> <laughs> Your terms are acceptable, sir. Small Lieberland will smile upon you. Um, and uh, But then I, I... And also, I should say... I have this bank account open to this day, like with my passport. So, who U.S. Knows? passport? Yeah, <laughs> as the ambassador of Lieberland. That's right. Occupation ambassador. Of ambassador. Of, yeah, I probably put that down on a, a form somewhere. <laughs> and um, <sighs> and so uh, then I I call the secretary of state. I'm like, I have a bank account, and he's like, How much is is? Can we put in it? Enough. And I'm like, A thousand dollars. He's like, That's not enough because you need to buy furniture too. And I was like, Fuck. And so uh, he's like, look, we're going to just transfer v- Bitcoin to the Syrian guy here. He's just going to give you $15,000. I was like, okay. What? Yeah, I guess that sounds <laughs> good plan, guys. Um, and so I go back to the office and he has his secretary just like walk across the room with $15,000 in an envelope. And she's like, I think this is for you. And opens it up and then just spread. Honestly, it's like so unsatisfying how few hundred dollar bills that is. I thought it would be like, you know, a steel, like steel briefcase or something. But it was it was just like a stack. And so I was like, OK, this is the treasury of Liberland, the amb- the embassy of Liberland, And I'm going to use this to buy aid. And Abdul Rahman is going to help me figure out what to do with that and he's like we got to go meet with the vice president again i'm like sweet let's go meet with the vice president love those guys i'm sure they're they're wondering what's been up with me since the cyclone when you meet these guys is it a handshake yeah yeah was there another cultural norm you were supposed to know hope not didn't know it you didn't try to dap them up i no i did not i was worried though because you seem like the guy who would have walked in there like yo what's up how's it how's it going (laughs) uh I like I I had really like I my my boots are just covered with shit all the time so I was so worried because I mean I already looked like I mean I looked like I had been rescued from a desert island basically like I was showering out of a water bottle uh, I was living out of a uh, of a, a backpack like I didn't look my best and but like shoes are important especially in in like you know the middle east and africa region and so like we walk into like this big banquet hall thing that's where that photo is from mm. and uh, i'm like fuck he's gonna look at my shoes my shoes are like just just garbage hiking boots and they're covered in shit you look good in this picture i'll put it back in the corner of the screen so people can see it it's somewhere here that was where the fuck did i put it 
Did I lose it? Yeah, that was the nicest shirt that I had. It was right here. Yeah, yeah. by far the nicest shirt I had. But fortunately, uh, I you take off your shoes before going into a banquet hall. So I was like, oh, thank God. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, so anyway, um, again, I like start talking like an ambassador, and I'm like, we, uh, on behalf of Lieberland. <laughs> Did you put an accent on? No. <laughs> this is just how I sounded in my own head. Like, we we w- want to help with the, the affected area of Cyclone Sagar, and therefore we will make an aid donation. And all I require of you, the vice president, is uh, a security detachment and an idea of, like, where the affected area is and what we can do. And he was like, okay, cool. I'll tell Abdul Rahman what you're supposed to do. And I was like, great, thank you. And Abdul Rahman was like, uh, we need $5,000. And I was like, oh, look, I'll spend less money on furniture and more money on aid. Make it eight. <laughs> <laughs> like, I'm the ambassador. <laughs> Whatever. We can buy less Are nice. they talking to each other in their language during this whole time? Oh, too? no. I, I t- I, we had the money conversation while well, it was just me and Abdul Rahman. Just the two of yeah, you. Yeah. Just chilling. Yeah, I wasn't going to. Uh, we used to just like. Drinking hang- some whiskey? No, no. It was, it was Ramadan. Mm. Oh, right. Yeah. yeah not no, drinking anything. Do that shit. Yeah. Uh, so we were just sitting in his car. He just had this big, like, Mercedes thing. The store, just when they're making this for Hollywood, just a little editor's note. Yeah. We need some whiskey, a little cigar. <sighs> you know, so, we gotta make it look a little more presentable. A little Abdul more Rahman cool. A little was more a, mad a manish, very you know? temperate man. He was a great guy. He and doesn't have to be in the movie, though. That is true. He yeah. can be like, you know, a I drug-infused guy who fucks hookers at night and is the vice president of this crazy place. Could right? never have done it with Abdul Rahman. Yeah. That man was, was, thank God for him. I would have gotten killed if it wasn't for him. Um... Anyway, he's like, "Look, we're gonna we're gonna buy this much food, and it was something like you know, a um, couple tons of food, and it was enough uh, food for uh, uh, this this village, this nomadic group of people to uh, survive for one month. And it was everybody got like um, big bag of flour, big bag of rice, oil, sugar, salt. Um, so, and you can see us uh, buying that." buying the food yeah you can see the um the uh hold on i gotta go back here and scroll down i'm sorry man no you're good yeah you're good i just i keep losing it uh this is back in 2018 all right that's 2017 so you have your page uh go down 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 now there it goes okay yeah so so this is the food right so That's we, what your money bought? Yeah, dude. We bought a lot of food. Did you get like the Costco like wholesale deal or? I mean, yeah, I think so. But everybody was speaking Somali around me. I have no idea. I literally just like handed Abdul Rahman. Yeah, that, like, could, that could feed a few people. What is that? Like rice and shit? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Rice, oil. If you uh, go to the next one. um, I don't want to lose it because yeah. I have to put just, these pictures uh, click in the X. Later. Click the X. I know, but I don't want to lose that picture because I'm not going to remember what the picture was. Oh, I see. You see what I'm saying? I have to go edit this. Area. Yeah, yeah. Don't don't worry about it then. But yeah, it's um, it was a shitload of food, and we so we we had it all loaded up. Um, had our our you know our worker guys load up this this enormous truck. It was the biggest truck I've ever seen. Um, and drive it out to this nomadic village. And then Abdul Rahman was like, "Well, okay, you um, you're gonna come with me, and we're gonna go out to the village together." Um, uh, and, and give the food to the people. And I was like, well, I mean, we sent the food, like, can't we, isn't that good? Like we, we gave aid. And then he's like, no, no, no. Like you have to, you must feed, you have to, (laughs) you have to feed them. No, no. He's like, you have to take pictures and stuff. Like, and I was like, oh, right. Oh, politician shit. Yeah. Yeah, Take credit. I was like, I'm, I'm not an aid worker. (laughs) Oh, right. I'm a fucking politician. Like, you got this is you tossing the paper towels like Trump. Yeah, this with is the, with the jump shot. The, uh, just tossing paper towels, be like, <laughs> "Yep, got those nomad." And it's just like it made me feel like I don't know. I, I had been touching upon it the entire time. Like I, I would have these moments where I would find myself sort of becoming compromised by this albeit ridiculous position that i was in i mean 
yeah, I was an ambassador f- because I was on the right jet ski at the right literally. time. Literally, yeah. Quite literally. Yeah. I was an ambassador in name only, and at the point that people started treating me as if I was this person with political power, in certain way, I started acting like it. Like, I started, like, feeling yeah. like a politician. And it was because I had this unearned power, and I had... Uh, the the respect of people who I could I could you know make I had the ability to uh, to allow people to think that I had some kind of power which of course I didn't and that kept coming up in my brain as I noticed how I would behave even though I realized every single day that I, as I came back to this empty mansion that had no new furniture in it. That, like, I'm a fraud. But at the same time, this is real people. These are real nomads that actually need food. And it's like, well, it doesn't really matter at the end of the day if I'm, like, a fake ambassador or not. I got to get this food out there. But technically, to go back to the story element that you and I have touched on before, like, every country starts somewhere. Yep. You could call everything that happens the moment someone, like, in the bar you were talking about in the last episode we did about, you know, the Revolutionary War. Right. And one dude was like, fuck it, let's, let's leave Britain. Takes, right? takes one, one, two, They're or three. They're a fraud. Yep. They're a fraud right there. Yep. Now, I know this whole story is kind of funny because it's literally a thing called Lieberland. It's seven <laughs> kilometers and, yeah, yeah. you know, they're into crypto and shit yeah, and yeah, yeah. jet ski and Bunch of crypto. Pros. But still. No, but you're right. And that's the crazy thing about it because it's like where the rubber met the road was me in the middle of a desert talking to real people with real needs that we were trying to fill and also prioritizing getting photo shoot alongside of it so that like a good politician yeah and i i I say in the book i think the the you know the 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 line is something along the lines of like you know if you give aid and no one's around to take a picture, did you actually give aid at all? So sad that the world works that way, but it does. It's soft power, and I was, for better or worse, I was the uh, the object of, uh, I was the instrument to deliver soft power on behalf of Liberland to Somaliland. And that was a very strange day, because not only you're, you're, you're going, you're traveling so much further, I mean, the most remote place I've ever been in my entire life. It was eight hours of traveling on no roads, armed guards. Uh, we're traveling with the the vice president's secretary. He's operating as, as my um, um, as my translator. Uh, Abdul Rahman's there. At one point, we uh, I think I have a picture of it here. Uh, we just come across a, a bus that's just overturned. Yeah. Yeah. It just, and mind you, we're like four hours away from anything that would look like a building right and what why was it overturned it just fell over i guess they they took a took a turn too quickly and then everybody gets out of the bus and they uh like it's like no words are exchanged it's like they've seen this happen before so they all everybody piles out of the bus and i'm like abdul rahman like what's what's going on what are we doing here and he's like oh the bus fell over and i was like no i know i got that but like what do we what do we do about it and he's like oh well you know get some ropes and so so we all just like attach ropes get over here ambassador yeah just just we just pull this bus back onto its wheels and then you know they're like see ya now when you're coming across like regular people they don't speak English, obviously. No. But do you know what they were calling you in their language? Were they mm-hmm. calling you like Mr. Ambassador? Oh, I have no idea. You have no clue. I have no clue whatsoever. I would have totally been like, I'm the ambassador of Liberland. I, every <laughs> once in a while, I would hear the word like Liberland and, and like, you know, like, otherwise, like, laughing. I just learned my, yeah, I mean, you, it had to had to put on the game face, man. Yeah. <laughs> I, couldn't, I couldn't just start you giggling. Look, you do look intense. Like, the, the pictures we were looking at of you in that picture, like, you look like... You look like Seth Rogen in the movie where he has to act serious for a minute. I mean. And he just like goes full neutral, you know, neutral grip face. Yeah, yeah. It was. <sighs> so this is this is the um, uh, the leader of the village. Um, but where we show up into this, this basically it's just, just a patch of desert. Um, and there's like some temporary buildings, some like stick houses, things like that. 
and nobody's there. And I go up to Abdul Rahman, Rahman who's uh, sitting under this tree. I'm like, where is everybody? He's like, oh, uh, they're coming back. And also all of the aid is like portioned out and, and sitting in the middle of the desert. And um, so it's like for everybody to take. And granted, it's been there for a couple of days. And it's mm. like, dude, I don't like, can they just like, just take the food? Like why? Like food has been waiting there for them for a couple of days. But like the vice president says, we got to get this photo shoot. And like, mm. this is how it's got to uh, gotta happen. Anyway, I, I go up to Abdul Rahman and I'm like, hey, where is everybody? And he's like, oh, there's a funeral because there's an outbreak of cholera here. Um, oh, shit. Because remember, when the cyclone blows through, water pumps get taken out of the ground, no way to feed the animals, and it trickles down. So you can't you can't water the animals. The wa- animals have to drink from groundwater. Uh, they, uh, they have to use the restroom somewhere. People start drinking that. And then, you know, when you lose something as simple as a water pump, then you also get a cholera outbreak too. And so they're coming back from a funeral and I'm just sitting there under this tree with Abdul Rahman being like, do we, like, do we have to do like this sort of political dance right now? And he's like, yeah, yeah, it's fine. It's fine. Like what for all 10 followers of the Lieberland Instagram? Seemingly. Okay. I, I know. And so we go and do it. I talk with the the sort of leader of the uh I talk with the leader uh through my my translator. Um there's a there's a video of that up there. Um and say, you know, uh as as best as possible and, and you know, I'm I'm trying to not I'm trying as hard as possible not to be full of shit here because it's like such not the moment to be a goofy mm. ambassador guy um i'm just like you know we're I, we hope that you uh that that you enjoy the food and and that this helps um you know i'm this is on behalf of liberland and and please you can tell me anything that uh that you might need uh, uh and i will make sure to put that in my report to the president right and so then he takes me to the desert and uh, he shows me uh, these, uh, this image of um, the one down here. Yeah, yeah. So those are uh, those are goats, dead goats, obviously. Yeah, dead goats. So they they were running away from the cyclone as it came through, and and it basically looks like um, the goats almost look like they've they've they're made of stone, like they've been sandblasted <coughs> until they're almost bones, and. You can see the the phone numbers written on them because that's how people take like keep track of their goats there. And Wait, what? Yeah, you can still see that. How do you how do you see that? Mm, oh, Pictures it, in the corner of the screen for people to take a look. Yeah, you you can't see it on these ones, but but you can see it on. Where some, would it be written? It'd just be on their sides, like right here where my mouse is. Yeah, mm-hmm. that's that you. Is it in like pen? No, no, like spray paint. Yeah, it's not like carved in blood, right? No, no, no. It's it's written in spray, spray paint so that you can keep track of your goats because oh they have God. cell phones yeah. and stuff. Okay. Um. So yeah, I mean, he's like, look, this is what happened to, it. and they keep wealth in animals, and sure. Now the sort of base level of their keeping their animals, the the pumps are gone. They're ripped out of the ground. Now their animals are dying. Clearly. There's this even worse knock-on effect that that their people are getting sick because of the lack of of water because of the animal. So like this is you know countries that uh, have an emergent economy, countries with uh, the infrastructure to withstand a disaster that have the ability to come back from a des- disaster can deal with these things. Right. But people who are living so deeply into the fringes of the developed world, when something bad happens, it goes from bad to catastrophic so quickly. Yeah. Real quick to all my Discord people out there, the Julian Dory Discord is officially live. I put the link down in the description below. So go hit that, join the community, and say what's up. There's all kinds of features in there, and I look forward to hearing from you guys. Let's get it popping. And so I'm sitting there. Well, I'm not sitting there. I'm, I'm just talking with the man. Um, as we sort of walk through this really hot desert and, and I'm just saying, you know, I, I will tell everything to the president of Liberland and I'm like knowing full well, it's like, there's nothing I can do to 
influence whatever decisions that they make with the Libra land money. Because this was an optical decision. It was it was soft power. Soft power. Soft power is um, uh, diplomatic po- uh, power. Think sticks, not ca- or think carrots, not sticks. Um, so Peace Corps is a version of soft mm-hmm. power. It's done. It's diplomacy on behalf of the state. It's um, something that that potentially helps out your uh, your government. Uh, it provides free workers for you, uh, so long as they learn something. That's soft power. Okay. Um, diplomatic aid, soft power. Um, and so. I was just promising this guy I'll I'll tell tell the president everything but at the same time I was like is it kind of is there a kind of cruelty here for me even saying that you know does does that give this individual uh, a kind of of false hope if I'm just telling the telling him that I will tell the president uh, the president of a nation about his specific problems. He doesn't know that Libra Land is an empty island in the middle of a Danube. Oh, he doesn't know that? No, he's a he's a, a nomadic he's a nomadic oh, boat herder. Duh. You yeah. know? No shit, Sherlock. So. Yeah. I mean a very it's very likely like I'm I'm one of the first foreigners he's ever seen. So he's looking at you as like a potential savior, but you only have a jet ski that's yep. not even here with you. <laughs> I didn't even have the jet ski. You have a pontoon boat, too. <laughs> and, and that nice little houseboat. Um, yeah, so I was like, you know, that that was, like I said, that sort of rubber meets the road moment of, like, being a politician. I mm. found myself, so this is, the, to tie it back to the per- perverse incentives, right, to Moloch, this is that moment where I realize my incentives are to project this sensibility that you can trust me and that I have your best interests in mind and that I also have a certain amount of power which I can wield and will do so in a just way. That is the incentive of a politician and certainly the incentive of a diplomat. However, the perverse part is oftentimes they don't have any of those things. Mm. So... It led to me having a doing that in a false way because I didn't I didn't know that I was going to be a diplomat in you know two weeks before I became one. Right. I didn't know I was going to become a diplomat three days before I landed in Somaliland, and so it it became quite a moral quandary uh, at the at the end of the day. And I was eventually offered the position of of uh, Libra Land ambassador to Somaliland full time. Oh, so you were only a part timer for this one? I just I was you were the, the substitute teacher for for uh, Liberland. I was the I was the <laughs> the, uh, the the acting ambassador. Um, and but that's was, not what you told the vice president. Well, hey, look, you said was, on behalf of Liberland as the ambassador. I was acting like it, dude. Yeah. I was acting. <laughs> yeah, I was. The Are you act- a method actor? No, no, you weren't. No. Well, I, I, that's the uh, this is this Strasburg is Strasburg versus Adler. Yeah, it's it's a total a total sidebar, but I think method uh, like gets is, is sort of like blown out of proportion. It's like you you at least it, the way modern acting is taught is like you can you can like take little bits from each each method and you don't you don't have to be an acolyte of one right um, right but yeah but some of them are torturous like the strasberg method is pretty torturous that's what they say i mean i i the way that i think about it is like and granted i'm, I'm not an actor anymore and actually though i have been in an albanian sausage commercial recently God damn it yeah all right just just okay, just, just fucking put that you, to the side you can i can we'll show you i that. can show you the albanian sausage God it's fucking it. awesome i was also in an album Al- anyway okay. um <laughs> So, uh, so yeah, I, I was like, well, I, at the end of the day, I was offered the position of ambassador full time. And then I was like, oh my God, I can actually do it. I can actually figure out a way to drive some more aid. And then I didn't have to be a liar in front of that guy. And then I was just sort of feverishly trying to figure out how I was going to readjust my life to like live in Somaliland now. And then. Is that a phone call coming into you? Like, yo, you want to do this full time? I think it was an email. Like it was an email. <laughs> Did it have a signature at the bottom or just like a regular little Gmail? Like, yeah, what's up, fam? I have a very casual relationship with, right. with my uh, my my former uh, uh, employer. <laughs> <Your> f- 
and and then I like I, I was. Did I you was, demand a salary? Th- I would have um, if I actually took the position full time. Um, oh. Well, I, I talked. To, dun, dun, dun. I, I was talking with my family back home, and they were like, "No, the fuck, you're not." Yeah, what, what have you? What? Where is you? Like your dad and mom in this? <laughs> like when have? Did you not talk to them after 2013? Or, or oh like, yeah, what? no, no, they're great. They're they're awesome. They're very supportive. I mean, and Lord knows I've. And I've, you're just calling them from like these countries, like, "Yo, what's up? Yep. I'm the ambassador of Liberland," mm-hmm. and they're just like, "Cool." Cool. Yep. Sounds good. That's right. That's yep. it. My mom uh, my mom was the one who was like like I, I told her about and granted I was like not not well while I was in in Somaliland for that entire time. I mean, like I said, I'm showering out of water bottles. I'm I, I I'm surviving off of of Pringles and cans of tuna. Did the, your parents send you any money at all? No, no. no uh-uh. I if I would have sent you some money. Thanks, man. I would appreciate it. Yeah. It'd have to be in Bitcoin so I could it, get. <laughs> <laughs> See, if you were my son and, and I'm like, yo, my kid's an ambassador and he's poor, I'm sending him some money. Well, I he's I, doing he's doing God's work. Out my, there. my mom was was like like I because I told her about the ambassador position and and then I was like you know feverishly like oh i think i could do some good here and blah blah blah, blah. and she's like no no you can't you're not have living you seen black hawk down you dumb fuck <laughs> yeah i mean more or less that and and like normally uh, i you know it, it, if uh, apologies <sighs> mom i know i've put you through a lot oh my but God. like normally it's just like it's like oh i'm gonna do this thing that i think is really neat and they're like okay all right cool do whatever you want like you know just be safe i and love I'm that like, your mom's like get the fuck out of here at this point she was like no you're, you're not, not good. You're gonna be shit. the ambassador you need to get out of somaliland and get some air conditioning because your head's all fucked up because you've been sweating and being eaten by mosquitoes for like six weeks and I was like, "You're right. Yes. I I got to get out of here." And um, yeah, got got out of Somaliland. So you answer my question it, I, before I got to ask it. Like you were there for a full six weeks. Six weeks, yeah. That yeah. was your ambassadorship. Boom. You put that on LinkedIn. I thought about it, but it makes me sound fucking crazy. No, you got it. You think it, I bro. should? I don't think it'll LinkedIn, help. LinkedIn. No one's even on that. Well, people are on that, but they're all weird yeah. at this point. Oh, sorry, but you know LinkedIn, what? Though I, I forgot to. I forgot the the most. You're important. not all weird. I'm sorry. <laughs> I forgot the most important part. I got furniture too. I bought all the furniture. Did you go to IKEA outside the country? No, it was like me and uh, me and you found an Amish guy in Somalia. <laughs> I wish they, they, they got <laughs> some similar beards, dude, dude. Got some similar beards. The Amish fucking know carpentry, how to do... unreal. The... I know you're not watching right now because like not electricity, <laughs> like people, but like just for the record out there, great shout out can i can i talk about somali furniture in this case um you can talk about whatever the fuck you want pal. look i went it's to i went to like three different furniture makers in somaliland and i figured this was going to be a lot easier than it was because for some reason there were so many bed like like bed boards with just like roaring lion faces and just like a lot of swoops and mirrors and glitter all over everything and i'm like this is not furniture for an embassy i need like the most muted dull furniture that you can get so like i and like some had like neon lights and shit in it i need elevator music think I, that yeah like like i want the most boring furniture and then like after like the third store i'm like fuck it i'm just gonna get liberland the wackiest furniture oh, oh eventually i found some good bedroom sets and and like i bought like a whole like banquet table how much are you spending on this i spent five thousand dollars on it <laughs> so not like the whole budget Almost. <laughs> I had, I had. Uh, At least you left them with good furnishing. No, look, I had your position. I had a little bit over two, uh, a little bit under two thousand dollars <laughs> left over at the very end of it. And mind you, I am poor as fuck at this point. I'm so poor, and I'm thinking to myself, like, I. Nobody in the world knows that this little stack of hundred dollar bills exists. I could just easily pocket this money. And survive. Like, I think I probably had $200, maybe $100 left in the world because I was waiting left. for, yeah. I mean, like, like my own personal money. You're definitely the poorest ambassador in the world. Fuck yeah, because yeah. I wasn't corrupt. And that was the thing. <laughs> I was a good ambassador. You're goddamn right I was. I was like, I was, uh, like at the end of the my service, I was like, you know, it would be fine to just like take a couple bills. Like, that would, that would, like, it's a down payment. The and power also, was getting to your head. And I was like, no, man, like, 
if I do that, like, I am no different than any other corrupt politician. However, admitting it, because I've admitted it in print already, I did take some money. I took $5. No. And I went and I bought, uh, a, it's a drug called Cot. It's an East African hallucinogenic. You spent government money that the taxpayer drugs. pays to you on drugs. Yep. I'm admitting it officially. Find God. It's all <laughs> you, sir. You're a disgrace. Have, have besmirched the name of Lieberland. You're a fucking disgrace. You're, so... you're just like the rest of them. I know. It. A corrupt, <laughs> greasy, stealing politician. I got so much caught for $5. What is What the fuck is caught? It's this leaf um, that's that's widely eaten. It's legal in in Somaliland, um, and and also Yemen. It's pretty pretty popular too. Um, you uh, uh, get like a big branch of these leaves, and you um, you either strip them off one or eat them one by one. Um, some places swallow them. Some p- places you just like mash it up in your teeth, and then you get like this sort of mildly hallucinogenic euphoric effect from it it's like having the energy of like 12 (laughs) cups of coffee but no anxiety it's awesome interesting really good yeah i had a had a great time um it's a pain in the ass to actually like get to having an effect because you have to eat so many leaves and like the leaves taste like I mean, leaves like so you're just Can you like, like mash them up and put them in something. So what I did was um, my my method was I would because uh, you're, you're good. You're an organized drug user. That's right. Yeah, oh boy. <laughs> that's you know, I, I'm 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 an old man. I'm not my first rodeo. Um, so I would like because I ate one leaf and then I'm like, God, that's disgusting. And it's just like eating a leaf and. So it's like, well, I, I mean, I got to get high. So let's <laughs> like, we're going to eat these leaves somehow. Um, so I like would mash like five of them into a little ball. And then I just put them in my back teeth and just like chew as hard as I could. And then like wash it down with like a non-alcoholic Somali beer. And then I just, a non-alcoholic yeah, it, Somali beer. Actually pretty tasty. Good stuff. What's the point? It's just a soda. They just call it a non-alcoholic beer. It was good. Okay. I, I, very refreshing. All um, right. I, apple was my favorite. Um, so I, then I just like washed down the cot with that. And I felt like nothing after, you know, an hour of eating leaves. And then I was like, well, I better take a lot more because <laughs> that's always a good idea. <laughs> You always know that there's no consequences to not feeling any any drug and then just deciding that you're going to take a shitload more of it. And so I did. And then, like, I was sitting at home. I was sitting at the embassy. You know, it's kind of like walking through. And now, like, all the the, the rooms are full of furniture. And, and I, you know, we, we've done the aid thing. And, and, and I was, like, I had nothing else to do as ambassador. I was leaving the next day or two. So I just kind of, like, sat on on my uh my balcony and it's just like looking at the the sunset and are you near the coast Mm -mm, no No, pretty far you're totally in land at this point yeah just desert desert as far uh, desert and then on the horizon you'll see um there are these two mountains that are actually called the breasts of hargiza um and so these two sort of twin twin peaks now because this is not necessarily a highly industrialized part of the world can you see the clear stars oh yeah yeah gorgeous Really, really cool. So that's awesome. It was, yeah, it, and and that's when I started really feeling like these, you know, sort of euphoric effects. And also, like, I I was, regardless of the the intense amount of ambiguity um, from from an ethical level, like I was I was very proud that that we were able to get that food out to those people. Like, um, I was very glad that uh, that nothing horrible happened to me um and that i mean this was the end of my year of of living statelessly like this was a weird idea that ma- metastasized into this insane trip where i went from being a third grade teacher in iraqi kurdistan to being a ambassador in somaliland didn't take long bro this is all like yeah this is under a year kind of it's about a year almost exactly yeah. so you went from teacher with warmongering chick yeah somehow to 
what was it? Kosovo. No, 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 no. Getting banned from... No, no, no. What was the country? Bulgaria. Yeah. You get arrested in Turkey. Briefly. And then banned from Turkey. Banned from Turkey. Sent back out. Go to end Kosovo. Up in, end up in Lieberland. Hold on. So I go to Kosovo after after I got banned from Turkey. Lived there for the 10-year anniversary. Moved to Transnistria. Uh, I was in Transnistria for... We're going to come back to all this. A month or so. Um, Where's Transnistria? It's between uh, Moldova and Ukraine. Um, it's the... And it's it's protected by Russian soldiers. So... <laughs> yeah, it's... it's definitely a spicy you are, area you are a loaded weapon well by wow. that point i was like yo i gotta put my sim cards in my boot <laughs> like my boot is so full of important shit at this point <sighs> like, i don't know how you're not dead dude me neither man it's, it's, i i i yeah okay. you know i i think no i think I, I think there is a sort of karmic thing about this, though, like, and, and it's something that I try to pay attention to as much as possible, because, you know, I'm a I'm a recovering Catholic uh, as well. And like, you know, I, I don't the the uh, best relationship that I have with the divine is is, you know, on good days, I'm I'm like such a, a California Eastern religion person where i'm just like yeah i'm just like enjoying the moment <laughs> and then on terrible days i'm running back to like bearded sky god being like why did i do all these things that make me miserable <laughs> why am i like this <laughs> sorry for all the stuff i did because i wanted to <sighs> like that's my relationship with it but i think that there is this kind of there's this middle ground with with karma where it's like mm. If you genuinely try to 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 do good things and and make it a point to um you know to to treat people as well as you can uh and your aims really aren't malicious uh I think that and you you trust people and you give people the benefit of the doubt I mm. think more often than not the world does meet you halfway and and takes care of you in a in a good way. I mean, I think you would know. Yeah, I've had I've had a lot of close calls and and I'm uh when they happen and I'm sure that that something like this will happen again. It's a bit too common, um but it's something I'm trying to to move away from uh lifestyle-wise these days. Um <laughs> for obvious reasons. Um but for whatever reason, I I am still walking around, and I I can you know put these sentences down in a book, and I I feel really really grateful to be able to do that. Fuck yeah, man! It's yeah. an amazing story. Once again, obviously, as we're continuing the conversation here, the book is "You Are Not Here," which is a fucking amazing title, by the way. Thanks, man. And I am going to be reading this because, like I said, I haven't read this yet because we did this pretty last minute. Oh, uh, I, I, I have enjoy to it. read it now for sure. And <laughs> everyone out there, the link will be down in the description. Show some love to this book. It's what, like 300... 360 pages, something yeah, like that. Beautiful, yeah. man. And and the thing that that we haven't talked about, which I'm gonna save pe for people uh, in the book, are the kidnapping attempts. Son of a bitch! Yeah. You can't just do that. No, nah, man. Podcast. No, all I right. gotta. I mean, all right, okay, all right. You're gonna have to buy the book on yeah. all the kidnapping attempts. No, <laughs> well, you you were the kidnapper. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I didn't. I didn't kidnap anybody really well. Um, I was like, "You want to get in this car? No? Okay. <laughs> well, have a good day. Bye." <laughs> no. All right. Well, right before I, I do want to get to the Balkans now. Finally, yeah, yeah, I've been sure, waiting sure. for this all yeah, day, but just wrapping up the very end of Lieberland. So you end your six week stint. Yep. You don't accept the long term. Nope. Why didn't you accept it? Because I was gonna lose my mind. I, I it was it was so stressful to be. Uh, I mean, look, okay, so I'll 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 briefly touch on on uh, on the, so on the kidnapping attempt. Um, I had two, <laughs> I had two attempts, um, and yeah. uh, and also one mugging attempt while I was there. Like it's, hmm. you know, Somaliland's a great place. Uh, it is sounds great. Uh, <laughs> sounds wonderful. It's can't wait to go. Struggling in a lot of ways, and that's that is in no way the the fault of the people. That's no, the fault of history no. and colonialization, colonial colonization. Um, but it's not a safe place. So yeah, it's like I was on my guard a lot, and that's just not good for your brain to live that way. Because they would have wanted if you're the ambassador, you gotta live there full time. Well, and I'd have to have more. I I mean, you know, I'd have to live like. I, my my guard guarded the embassy. It didn't. He didn't guard me. So like, wait, 
explain the difference? Well, it, it's not like he would leave the embassy oh, with me. Right, right. His your job place isn't at the embassy. Correct. So, mm-hmm. like, if I went out on the town, um, then how big was the embassy? Nine bedrooms. They had a bank. Why didn't you just live there? Uh, well, I mean, it was empty. It was just, but <laughs> it's just a big empty mansion. Why didn't you live there? I didn't want to. I know I did live there. That's where I was staying. So he did guard you. Yeah, but like I would leave. I would go other oh, places. Oh, so like if so you he went to like, like the Wawa. Yeah, yeah, if I was going to the Hargeys <laughs> Wawa. Actually, there they did have they did have like little like convenience store set up. So um, like a Seven Eleven and Hargeys. So there were like these these um, uh, shipping containers that had you know sort of staple foods in them. Uh, but like I think that was just kind of a a setup for. Um, like a lot of the aid agencies were right next to where my where not my where the embassy was. So it's like Doctors Without Borders had their compound, um, Norwegian Relief Council had their compound, the UNHCR, whoever. Everybody had their compounds there, and so like I would get you know tubes of Pringles. I don't know. I can just say this on record. I have no idea how Pringles does it, but Pringles is in every single place in the entire world. How the fuck? They're the cockroach of food. They just don't die. It's 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 insane. I mean, yeah. look, I I can't hate on them because I've survived off of Pringles so much. But like that was, sounds terrible. It's not. That took some years off your life. Not good. Not good at There's all. There's like a lot of seed oils in that shit. Right? I know. Yeah. Got to be some bad shit. I felt bad. Yeah. I w- didn't didn't not feel natural. didn't feel good after six no. weeks there. No. <laughs> just covered in mosquito bites and Pringles and just yeah. Pringles. Mm. Yeah. So, and they're salted, so you're thirsty as fuck, yep. right? Mm-hmm. How's the water there? Is it like Flint, Michigan? Uh, it came out yellow in the in the embassy. Oh, yeah. yeah, so yeah. not good. That's not that's mm-hmm. not great. That's not a good combo. So these are all reasons why I didn't accept the position. Right. Full so time. did you like not accept it via email, like your yeah. Gmail, and just like Pretty sorry, well. fam? Yeah, yeah, I'm out. I I, I sent <laughs> ambassador out, yo. <laughs> <laughs> I, I dropped my diplomatic papers. <laughs> What'd they say? No problem. <laughs> Pretty much. Yeah, I was like. <laughs> Well, and then I like it's uh, it's funny too because like I, you know, every once in a while we'll, uh, you, you know, Foreign Secretary Tom. He uh, it was my birthday. Uh, yeah, it was my birthday yesterday. He got on my Facebook. And he was like, "Happy birthday!" <laughs> like, thanks, Tom. <laughs> Hope you're good. Oh he lives god. in Florida. <laughs> oh my god. He's he's always traveling. He's I, I really like Tom. He's cool. I think he was working for Expedia.com when he wasn't making a making a country. Son of a bitch. I know it. Yeah. So you turn it down, and then you had a couple hundred dollars to your name? A couple hundred dollars to my name. Where'd you go? I went to Marseille. Um, In and, France? Yeah. I How'd you get there? Uh, planes. Uh, oh, no, I didn't. I actually took... Um, so <laughs> of course you did. So we were... <laughs> of course you did. Well, so I was staying with my, my girlfriend at the time. Um, I, I caught up with her in Bulgaria, and we just kind of chilled How'd out How'd you get to bit. Bulgaria with a couple hundred bucks? Like Ryanair? Oh, I mean, I, I the reason I had a couple hundred bucks because I had already pre-purchased all these flights. Okay. You know, like, like I could get out, but right, like, I didn't good. have much. You had a get-out plan. Yeah, well... Like I, any good CIA spy, you had a... You had an extraction plan. Yeah, my extraction plan was like Ryanair. <laughs> hey, listen, you got it. first thing about CIA spy, be forgettable. That's right. Blend in. I, I have I have a problem with being forgettable, as you're, you might imagine. No, no, I think you're I think you're very forgettable. Oh, you're, you're, thanks, you, man. You kind of like roll in, you know, do your thing. You're not an attention whore. You no. know what I mean? Like that's that's a compliment. Thanks, you're, man. You're forgettable. Yeah. Um. I appreciate that. That's great. Uh, I, you know, like I said, look, CIA. I need a job. Uh, Judd Apatow. I need a job. One of you guys could help me out a lot. But you get back to Bulgaria. So I get. Well, I got. I got to Dubai, and I was in Dubai for like twenty four hours, and that's so culture shocking. After, after, <laughs> like. Oh, what the fuck? <laughs> like, oh, 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 people friend. walking around on gold, on like gold heels and shit. Oh my god, it yeah. was I, my, like my, I could feel. I felt like my brain was like I could hear the cracking of my brain as I like emerged and in, into Dubai, and then I immediately went to find the f- nearest air conditioned place and just like, and and eat something that was was like a vegetable. That was awesome, um, but then fucking expensive. Um, so yeah, went to uh, we we caught up in Bulgaria. She finished her Fulbright service, and then 
uh, neither of us was really ready to go back to the States yet. Um, I had some some paychecks come in from articles that I was writing because um, I was still freelancing. Uh, it just it, that it takes it's slow to get those checks. Right. And so we just shoestringed it in Marseille for a summer. And that was actually great. Like it was it was a perfect town to do on the cheap. They had, you know, the beaches are free um, and they had cool public events that were easy to do. You could rent a bike for like a euro. Um, so, yeah, wonderful, wonderful summer. But the cool thing was that was the summer that uh, France won the World Cup. Oh, shit. Right. So it was like the perfect. And I didn't realize it until I, when I was finishing this book, but it was like the perfect moment of trying to figure out what a country is where it's like suddenly there's this mm. arbitrary goal and i mean literally a goal this arbitrary thing there's a bunch of people who are kicking a ball around somewhere in russia and that is bringing all of these people together wow suddenly like i am you get it. as you know as french as possible like i don't even give a shit about football but like it was i i felt the sort of like borders of my own individual identity blurring a bit as we were all hoping that you know france won and then they did and then the the celebration that comes after that where people are just like pouring into the streets and everybody's giving you free wine and and they're shooting off fireworks and it's like holy shit like this is this is the the reason that we create these national stories to feel this to feel that you're a part of mm. this one glorious thing that like That's a yeah even though i didn't i don't even care about football even though i didn't kick that goal in, like to win the world <laughs> cup i feel a it. little bit like i yes. did just because i was in france at the time and i was like that's it's that's what nationalism that brings people together yeah yeah real quick i gotta go to the bathroom yeah. we'll be right back yeah yeah all right, we're back. So we're finally going to go. You were just talking about Marseille and, yeah. and going there after the whole Lieberland thing to cool yeah. off yeah, with yeah. your girl. Yeah. But we're going to go back to the thing we've kind of skipped over, yeah. which was in between being banned from Turkey <laughs> and going to to Lieberland, yeah. which is you spent time in Kosovo. Now, Kosovo and Transnistria were between those. Yeah. And we're going to talk about yeah. that because that's involved with the Russia-Ukraine war. That's yeah, fucking man. crazy. So Fascinating. This is, we're going to get into this right now. Word. But the whole Balkan concept, like Kosovo and stuff like that, about a year and a half ago, I saw something. I think it was, if I remember correctly, I think it was a, like a picture of Time Magazine in 1999 with the famous NATO bombs on Kosovo. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I was like, what the fuck is that? And I started to look into it and I realized how insane the 1990s power vacuum of the Balkans was huge. And then I started looking into the history of the Balkans and, you know, cause things are tied to the land and the yep. people, it's just giant culture thing. But essentially for people out there who aren't familiar and I'm going to let you explain a lot. I just want to yeah. set some of the, 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 the groundwork here. The Balkans used to be, what was it? Yugoslavia. Yeah. Um, depending on how far back you go, but yeah. But you, that was during the Soviet era. They were one nation. Called, except for Albania. Albania was never a part of Yugoslavia. Albania was not a part of Yugoslavia. But among these nations in this area, and I'll put this a screenshot of this area in the corner of the screen for people to see. But among these nations, you have you have Slavic people, right? Mm -hmm. And you have the Serbs, you have the Croats, who are, a who are a little different. You have the yep. Bosnians, who are different. And then you have the Albanians, who are offshoots of like the ottoman times so the illyrians the, the Illyr right the illyrians and beck lover when he was in here yep. for number 95 he explained a lot of this and we're gonna have beck in again at some point hey, when great we make this move because this is the last this is the last podcast that's happening in this studio banking, I, a, banking a bunch of stuff for you man i think i may put this out even like last because i've filmed a bunch this week so i don't know the order but maybe i'll put this one out last yeah. of all of them so you'll be the last one ever sick man but we're making this move up to hoboken and and moving the studio and everything so i know beck is up there so when we get up there he's going to come on and do one but we had talked about a year and a half ago something like that on on the podcast and beck is obviously full albanian and yeah we'll tell everyone who knows about <laughs> I, I, it almost 150 percent yeah think. yeah he but, is that man is albanian to the core he really is but 
you know, he had talked about the Illyrians and stuff like that, but the Albanians over time ended up spread across a bunch of countries. Correct. Now they were they were concentrated in the area of Albania, which I believe became a country in the early like after World War One. Nineteen twelve. Right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so right was, before World War One. And also the reason for the sort of the um the the cozy relationship between Albania and uh and the United States is because the the person who spearheaded uh the or yes. who who championed Woodrow the, Wilson. Woodrow Wilson. Yeah. 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 And in fact I, I live in uh, in Tirana near near uh, uh, Sheshi Vudro Vilson. So yeah, they like, fucking love the U.S. over yeah. there. They got a, a statue of George W. Bush. <laughs> <laughs> that and that's hard to do. Isn't that, isn't that crazy? That's hard. Now watch this draft. <laughs> yeah, I know. Like <laughs> <laughs> mission accomplished statue. There's even a there's a a bakery in <sighs> um uh in, in the same area that it's like like I guess he sat in at one point and and they were like okay well this seat is reserved for George Bush whenever he comes back to the bakery. Oh my god. Well, he's got something around the world. That's anyway, right. Yeah. But the when Yugoslavia forms to go more towards today during the Soviet bloc, Soviet Union breaks up by 91. Mm -hmm. Yugoslavia now has has all these different tribes, mm. right? And they all had a giant vacuum as I pointed out that caused all kinds of violence and it's an ignored time in history because the 1990s were like a great time in the US everyone Men in was Black was coming out yeah, I think everyone Independence Day everyone was yeah. focused on the blowjob in the Oval Office right. like that was the most important thing Right. so people are forgetting about all this shit in Europe which involves a lot of people and I believe you had like the Bosnian genocide Yep. And then you also had which was obviously any genocide is horrible but it was yep. terrible and then you had and actually when I had sean ryan in here oh he's great i like his podcast yeah really that, cool that was a fun episode when you're in baghdad in that time period you could just hear the car bombs going off all day all night hear the gunshots hear the gunfights and it was just bombs terrorists suicide bombers all the time people coming back off up seeing these vehicles getting blown up seeing what's left of them if anything i mean it was this guy died, this guy died, this guy died, this guy died, and, and that's why we were so busy. We were killing these guys that were making the bombs, we were killing the guys that were planting the bombs, we were killing the guys that were detonating the bombs, and it was saving American lives. But Sean was actually the guy who, he was supposed to go in as a Navy SEAL undercover and try to get some of the guys who did that. Ooh. And he ended up being pulled. He was trained by MI6 to do it. And then Jeez. he was pulled to Afghanistan. So Oof. he didn't go in. But anyway, then a very ignored one is Kosovo. Yep. And so the Albanians, I started to say this a few minutes ago, but the Albanians, as I understand it, were spread all over Yugoslavia. They were, they, and then outside of Yugoslavia, they had their main hub in Albania. But these are people who are in Macedonia. They were in Serbia. Yep. They were in Croatia, and they were heavily concentrated to the point where they were like ninety percent of the population in this land that was, you know, a part of Yugoslavia. That when it was broken up, was given to Serbia, mm. where there's like no Serbs. And so in the nineties, the people there, the Albanians, wanted to form their own country. This country in 2008, as you've already mentioned, ended up becoming Kosovo, mm. which is still not recognized by some countries around the not world. Not entirely. It's over a hundred countries, and I think there's there's a uh, some some finer points. That was a good that's a good uh, yeah, a good breakdown it of it. Thank um, you. Very very good. Um, uh, some of the 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 finer points that I think are are, are worth mentioning, right? Um, because you know one of the one of the things that I mentioned in the book is that. Since this history goes back so many, I mean, centuries, uh, you know, one of the most important historical moments for Kosovo was the Battle of Kosovo, and that was in 1389. But you talk to people in the Balkans today, and they bring up the Battle of Kosovo that happened in 1389, and you might as well think that it happened last week. Wednesday, you know, the, 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 the curse and the blessing of a long history is there's a great deal of cultural wisdom that trickles down through a long history, but the curse of it is there's also a lot of, of cultural antagonism that exists mm -hmm. in a long history. And so in the Balkans, there is this patchwork quilt of love and hate and, um, uh, legacy conflicts 
and alliances that have been forged and then broken again and then forged again. And so what the area is left with, it's also, and this is, this bears mentioning because I think it's absolutely critical about the Balkans that, that people oftentimes overlook, is that during the Crusades, this was the overroute land to get from Rome and Western Europe to the Holy Land, right? Mm. So this is one of the reasons that it was constantly a thoroughfare for world events. And it also constantly bred conflict. Holy shit, I never thought about that. Yeah, it, it's, it's overlooked, but it's deeply important. Um, and that's why, you know, there is a, there is, there are similar, similar cultures there, certainly, but there's also vast differences between each of the cultures. Um, so going back to the sort of like proto um, state level, and I'm going to say I'm going to do uh, both sides version of it. Uh, and this is an overly simplistic way of talking about Kosovo uh, because it is, I mean, it, you know, whole books are written on, on Kosovo. Yes. Um, and uh, but and, I, the, I, and the genocide there, that's what blew my mind. It, no just, one talks about that. Yeah, it's the Serbian astounding. genocide against Kosovars, or yep. Albanians, Albanians, I should yeah. say. I mean, holy shit. Yeah, it's it's pretty pretty remarkable. Um, but from the let's say the Albanian point of view, um, this is this is uh, so I'll I'll steel man their point of view on on this, and then sort of uh, and then do the same with the Serb point of view. Sure, and that will will kind of get us to why this is you know um, such a, a a combustible place, right? Um, so from the Albanian point of view, these are ancestral Albanian lands. Um, the Albanian people uh, <coughs> consider themselves uh, the indigenous people of the Balkan Peninsula. Slavic intrusion or Slavic migration, depending on who you ask, of course. And can you define what a Slav is? Uh, it's, it's hard to do, actually. And, yeah. and of course, full, full books can be written about this, too. But um, uh it is uh, what what some people uh, I think the the, the general um, uh, uh, current understanding of Slav is that it is a uh, so the word Slav uh, some people believe is an antonym for uh, the word word meaning that the Slavic people are united by Slavically based languages they use similar mm. language so they they come from a similar language group. And oftentimes, uh, though this is not always the case, because of course there's an enormous amount of of uh, diversity in any person group. As I, you know, we we're talking about the Kurds earlier. There are there are many different Kurdish languages, many different Kurdish dialects, different belief structures, government structures. You know, no person group is um, completely homogenous, and the Slavs are the same way. But I digress. Uh, they are oftentimes um, Christian. Uh, and they speak similar language groups, uh, and they are people who some believe came down from the uh, from the steppe country of of uh, Central Europe, and that, that and so so during that time, and I can't remember why exactly, um, so I won't I won't guess. But anyway, there was Slavic migration. This was during the year like the year six hundred or so. Slavic migration going from the east coming towards the Balkans. And so that's where we start seeing the first Slavic artifacts and uh, the first, uh, like the the original Slavs who are moving into the Balkan Peninsula. At the same time, you have uh, the Illyrian tribes and the Albanoi tribes, so the Albanians, people who speak Albanian, which is totally different from any Slavic language. And they were already there. Already there, correct. And the Illyrians, who were the Illyrians? So uh, Illyrians were uh, the sort of original people of the Balkan Peninsula, but my understanding though of that word is it's like, it's a blanket term for the person, the people on that peninsula. So there were various tribes that existed within there, and the Albanoi tribe was the, the, the namesake of the Albanians. Um, in Kosovo specifically, the first sort of organized uh, group was the, I think it was called, the, the, they called it the Kingdom of Dardania, which has, um, uh, uh, has like archaeological roots. Um, How do you spell that? D-A-R-D-A-N-I-A. -A. Okay. There's even, you can even see the flag of Dardania. Um, it looks like an Albanian flag, but with some blue in it. Um, and so Albanians are all pointing to this stuff saying, look, we've been here forever. We've been here forever. We've been here forever. 
Um, the Serbian point of view is, yeah, you may have been here, but we were the first people to organize this as a state. You don't have a state. This is an astroturfed state. Like, we established churches here, and that's a good portion of why the there's so much conflict there, mm. is that it became a spiritual heartland for Serbs and for Serbian Orthodox Church. Um, there's some a very important monastery there, the Monastery of Gracenica. Uh, and there's also the uh, a really important site of the Battle of, of Kosovo, which was led by uh, Serbian Prince Lazar. So, and this is, this is a point that absolutely bears mentioning. Uh, there, I, I talk about two different cultural heroes in in Kosovo in the Kosovo section, right? I talk about uh, Prince Lazar, uh, and I talk about uh, uh, the Albanian freedom fighter Isa Bolatini. So both had similar aims. They wanted the Ottoman Empire to get the fuck out of the Balkans. They wanted to self determine. They didn't want their sons to have to go become janissaries. And they wanted their people to have their own land, right? Now, they lived 500 years. There's 500 years in between the two of them. Um, and so Prince Lazar and Isa Bolatini also both did something that, that is remarkable, knowing the Balkans as we do today, which is they worked together across ethnic lines in order to try and repel the Ottomans, right? Mm. So in the Battle of Kosovo... It's not just Serbs who are fighting the Turkish Empire or the, the Ottoman Empire. It's Serbs, it's Macedonians, mm -hmm. it's Bulgarians, it's Albanians. Everybody was lined up. Everybody. Yeah. Because that particular area might as well just be, you know, a super highway for a, a medieval army. It's a flat land and it's got it's got uh, two big rivers on it. So if you're a uh, an, an invading army and you're trying to invade the Balkans, you got to go through Gachanins, or pardon me, you have to go through Gazemistan. Anyway, that's why that battle was going to be there. And so what happened w uh, with that particular battle, uh, a lot of it's lost to history, but we know two things about it. We know that uh, Prince Lazar died during that battle, but we also know that the uh, the Ottoman Sultan Murad I died at that yes. battle. In fact, Murad... What year was this again? 1389. 13, yeah. Yeah. And so, this is where Skanderberg comes from, right? Is Skanderberg comes from uh, from Albania, um, or per, uh, like what we would know as the country of Albania today? But this is where his this was where his legend was made. This mm, time period, the uh, little bit before, little bit after, a little bit. Uh, Hold on, let me pull him. Up. Yeah, look it up. I, I, I'm, I'm, my time might be off, but I, I want to say that he was contemporary with um, Vlad Tepish. Oh uh, yeah, fourteen oh five to fourteen sixty eight. Yeah, he lived. so so pretty much just just right after. Got it. Okay. Yeah, and he so he was he led a rebellion against the Ottoman Empire in what is today Albania, North Macedonia, Correct. Greece, Kosovo, Montenegro, and Serbia. A member of the noble Castriotti family. Yep. He was sent as a hostage to the Ottoman court. He graduated from the Enderim. Oh, this is gonna go through his whole bio. I I I think I actually Treaty of Gaeta and. 15 in 1451. Yes, yeah, Skanderbeg was, in. Skanderbeg was um, uh, so he he helped repel the Ottomans when once they had actually occupied Albania. Um, the, the Battle of Kosovo was was to sort of stop the invading army from taking up more of the Balkans, basically. Um, and he came from a place called Mirdita, which is in northwestern uh, Albania. Wonderful place, beautiful. Mm. Um, I've been to his, his village before. There's a Little shrine to him, <laughs> pretty cool. Yeah, um, yeah. <laughs> uh, so anyway, uh, what you have here is you have from the Serbian point of view, they say, well, yes, this battle, we didn't stop the Ottoman Empire entirely, but we really did a lot of damage, and we put up a wall between the Ottoman Empire and the rest of from potentially their point of view. I don't want to speak for all Serbs, but like this is this is the dominant narrative, right? Um, from their point of view, we've also protected Christian Europe from invasion from outsiders. Mm. Um, from the point of view of, uh, you know, the Albanians, it's like, well, you lost the battle. 
Like, you know, your, your czar was killed. And also we've been here before this battle. Like you guys came in in the year 600 and we've been living on this land. And it's not like they don't have land either. Like the Slavs, like the Serbia has Serbia, Croatia has Croatia. And the issue here is with Serbia, but like they're trying to claim because Albania has its own country, as we said, but then there's this area of Kosovo where it's pretty much all Albanians and Serbia is trying to say, but this is Serbia. Yeah. Well, so this is, this is also uh, something that is, is so a part of the DNA of the Balkans. And I think it's, it, it, it bears understanding with empathy. Right. Um, and I, I, I say in a bit in the book that there's everybody in the Balkans has two maps. There's the map that exists. And then there's the map that sort of lives in your soul. Mm. And for everybody in the Balkans there they'll negotiate these two maps where an Albanian will talk about what's what they call Shipriamoth which is greater Albania which stretches all the way up to northern Macedonia or it it stretches into northern Macedonia goes to Montenegro bits of Greece that's Shipriamoth it's this this place that doesn't exist on a map but if Albania had its true borders according to them that's what it would look like. But wait, at the same time, there's also Greater Macedonia. And also, at the same time, if you talk to most Bulgarians, they'll be like, well, Macedonia is actually Bulgaria this whole time. <laughs> and if you damn, talk to bro. Serbs, they say, well, but what about Greater Serbia? And then on top of that, there's Republic Serbsky, which is this breakaway autonomous zone, which is like hugely Serbian nationalist, but it's in Bosnia. And they have political po- power in Bosnia Herzegovina. So, that's the Balkans. If you're confused, great. That's what that's what the area is. And why did you say, as a little side note here, yeah. you and I were talking in the car about this very quickly earlier. I, I'm not going to say it as smart as you did, no. but you were talking about how the Balkans are like the representation of like the formation of Europe. And I think you said it's because if they had it, if the Balkans hadn't defended all of Europe, which you kind of just outlined, but like all of Europe would have been Muslim Muslim rather than Christian. So, like, if you look at... I'm definitely saying this all. No, no, no. I, I think you're... I mean, you're... It, it, the, the, the goals of the Ottoman Empire was, was quite clear. You know, it's an empire. Its goal was expansion. Um, and how long was the Ottoman Empire around? Like, a thousand years? Nine hundred years? I want to say it's some, like, eight hundred. It's in the book somewhere. Um because I mean, like all of these places, the, uh, the majority of these places came uh, the the places that I profiled anyway. They either came from the Ottoman Empire or they came as a result of the Ottoman Empire. Um, should I? Do you want me to talk about like what the Ottoman Empire was? Please, please. Okay. This is because you know what? When we think about some form of like history being written in ways that we're supposed to study things and not supposed to study others, when you look at the history of like I don't know, like post jesus and nazareth or whatever Mm. we talk a lot about the romans Mm -hmm. then we skip a lot (laughs) yep we talk a lot about you know the william wallace and the formation of what we know as like royal england yeah then we get to like the american euro world Mm -hmm. and smack there very skipped in the middle are the many centuries of the ottomans yeah so let's let's lay that out uh, well so so uh First, it's important to understand that, like, it, it was all uh, – these are all various overlapping empires, right? The The Roman Empire was the uh, – uh, it was eventually subdivided into four different parts. There was uh, – and th- those four different parts were, were ruled because no one person could rule over all of these four different parts. The Western Roman Empire began falling. The Byzantine Roman Empire was hanging in there, um, but it was also eventually taken over by cultural intrusion from, I believe, it was the Seljuk Turks. Yeah, I'm. I'm sorry. I want to make a clarification here too, because I totally, in that explanation, skipped the Byzantines, yeah. who are the people who actually like took Rome. I think. Yeah. Right, and then the Ottomans came after that, but we totally ignore well, that. They all were Roman Empire at one point. So yes. the Western Roman Empire was the was when we talk about the fall of Rome, that's what we're talking about. We're talking about the fall of the Western Roman Empire. Um, you know, in, in Byzantium, like which was centered around Constantinople. Yes, 
which eventually becomes Istanbul, it, it, you have a more or less functioning ecosystem still. So while the West falls and perishes into the Dark Ages, the East begins thriving. But you also have cultural intrusions coming in through the form of the uh, the, the Seljuk Turks, uh, the Ayyubid Empire, which was actually run by a um, uh, uh, by a Kurdish guy, by Saladin the Great. Um, so I think that it was in like the year one thousand, somewhere mm. around there. Um, so you know, there's this vast history of the Middle East that comes from there that we're not usually taught in schools just because we put this huge dividing line between East and West, even though if it wasn't for the East being this this generator of, of knowledge and this repository of culture, we would have never gotten out of the Dark Ages, right? Mm-hmm. From the, uh, the, the East, we get algebra, we get... You know, all of the the science learning, oftentimes people will say that the Enlightenment originally started somewhere in uh, Central Asia. There's Mm. a wonderful book about this called uh, The Lost Enlightenment. I think it's by Frederick Starr. Um, But it it basically lays out the case that as uh, Central Asians came down, they were also bringing these enormous treasure troves of of knowledge and learning and the reason that we don't have you know the the cultural artifacts from them is because oftentimes their uh, uh their homes were were made nomadically but you have like some of these wonderful uh primary documents of like uh and this is this is from somewhere in in um uh, Central Asia, right? You have a primary document of like this treasure trove of of like mail that somebody buried in like a pot out there. And what the mail was was like it was it was a wife and her husband sort of, sort of going back and forth. And the wife was like, "Oh, you left me in Bishkek. Like, come on, man. Like, I gotta, you know, go somewhere else." And and it's a pretty casual conversation, but that's a remarkable thing, archaeologically speaking, right? Because what does that tell you? One, it tells you that they had a mail system that could travel for thousands and thousands of miles. Two, women could read and write. Three, paper was plentiful enough to, like, waste it on casual conversations. Like, this is an enormous amount of learning and and stuff that we completely lost in the Western Roman Empire when it fell. So, I mean, these are... That's why, uh, anyway, I've gotten away from the Ottoman Empire, but the Ottoman Empire. That's just great. Uh, do you have a, a map of the Ottoman Empire? Probably be yeah, good to right pull that up. Yeah. Ottoman Empire map. I love the Ottoman Empire. Yeah, so, I mean, look at this. It, I'll, put it, I'll put it in the corner of the screen for people. I mean, th- just to think about how vast this area is, it, it, you know, you're you're going over to the Caspian Sea, and you're also going all the way over across North Africa. All of the Holy Land. This is an, an yeah, and the, and and of course the Holy Land, which is so deeply important as like this this like you know you want to talk about how you create a nation, how you galvanize consent. What is one of the best, most compelling stories that's ever been told? I can tell you about three of them, and guess what? They're all in Jerusalem. Yes. That's why it's a really important place. Like, we can take... And what are your three for that? (laughs) Uh, Oh, uh, Islam, Christianity, and Judaism. Oh, you're going, like, the straight, full story. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah. I mean, take the divinity out of it. Like, even if you take the divinity out of it, there's there's a reason that, that that place has been fought over for centuries. Yeah, this is crazy. And all all the ball but just the full scope of it, like you said. All the Balkans, Greece, Turkey, the entire Holy Land, the northern part of north of the Holy Land, the Syria area, part of Iraq, into the oil field, so to speak. Not that that was like the big deal, but all the way down into the peninsula towards Yemen, all of Egypt, yep. northern Africa, all the way to Algiers by this Damn near the Strait of Gibraltar. I mean, goddamn. Well, and and it's uh, a lot of the reason, at least from from my understanding, like a lot of the reason that uh, that the 
you know the Catholic Church was trying to sort of push its its forces out into uh, into the Balkans was specifically because it's like they're trying to stem the rising tide of the Ottoman Empire mm. because once Rome fell. Well, then who took over as the dominant power center? Well, it was the Catholic Church. Mm. Right? Beca yeah. So, again, let's let's think about that, so that idea. So, holy again. Think about that idea of how you generate consent amongst the governed, right? I know I, I'm harping on it, but, like, I, I just want to sort of, like, uh, show you the, the myriad ways that you get to this. And one great way of doing it is say, you know how miserable your life is right now? Okay, well, great. <laughs> You're going to go to heaven. Yes. And heaven rules. But you got to do some tithing. You got to give us some money. But you also got to do, go do some crusading. Yep. And suddenly, if you control that narrative, if you control that, uh, that, uh, that abstraction like we were talking about earlier, then you become the most powerful thing in the area. You become... You're God. You're the representation of God. Yep. You go get me some Islamic scalps, you bring them back here, you're well, going to heaven. That's right. And, and you also, you think, I mean, uh, here's a great example of... Um, Not that they had a southern accent in no, the Catholic but... Church. <laughs> <laughs> I just need to channel Brad Pitt, you know? Yeah, that's good. Yeah. <laughs> I love Ottomans. <laughs> uh, I, I want love my me scalps. some Ottoman scalps. So here's a good example of, of uh, how belief can move people, right? Um I think this is, I, 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 you know what, before I even start talking about it, will you just look it up just to make sure it's sure. real? Uh, look up um, uh, Peter the Hermit and the Peasant's Crusade. Peter the Hermit and the Peasant's Crusade. Yeah, okay, so this is great. Cruci which, you want the wiki? Uh, yeah, sure. Okay. So Peter the Hermit, also known as Little Peter, Peter of Amiens, Peter of Cherries, it definitely fucked that up, was a Roman Catholic priest of Amiens and a key figure during the military expedition from France to Jerusalem known as the People's Crusade. Okay. Oh, yeah. So this, this, is, this is great. And this is a perfect example of how belief animates. And, belief and animates. Well, it's this th thing that we we're talking about in terms of like the Constitution too. You know, uh, people wrote a couple paragraphs down on a big sheet of paper, and then mm -hmm. they signed it, and then suddenly we have a revolutionary war. And the next thing you know, we're walking on the goddamn moon. <laughs> like uh, <laughs> belief animates. Like this is, I uh, you know, I try not to be pretty woo woo, but like it's fucking magic um, if you can get people to believe in things. And so Peter the Hermit was this guy. And when they were popularizing the Crusades, they would send, like, bishops around to the various towns. And, you know, they would be these sort of stirring storytellers. And they would be like, you're going to go and crusade and, and we're going to uh, – maybe you'll you'll die and, and don't worry, you're going to go to heaven. You know, these awesome Catholic pitchmen were going out there. And – all of the young men in the village would volunteer and they would place like a, um, a cloth cross on their like lapel to say, yeah, this guy, he he's going to the crusade. And and of course, you'd feel terrible if you didn't like have your cloth, your your cross when everybody else did. So everybody was like, you know, whipped into a frenzy about going to crusade. Um, and then Peter the Hermit comes along and he's like, yeah, we're going now. And people are like, what? And he's like, no, no, like, get your shit. We're going to go crusade right now. The the bishops, who were the sort of crusade pitch men, like, they were just get, tilling the soil and, like, you know, do some training in a couple of years. We're going to, like, make an army and everything like that. <laughs> but Peter the Hermit was like, nope, get your shit. We're fucking going, bro. Which way is Jerusalem? <laughs> we're going. <laughs> And he just led this crusade and he just started marching and people followed him because they were like so, you know, swept up in this idea of, of crusading that he accidentally started this first crusade or as it's called the peasants crusade. People just fucking followed this guy and it in one way caused some big problems later down the road, but it also caused some, you know, opportunities so 
Peter the Hermit marches everybody straight into Ottoman territory. They follow him for that long. And at this point, the Crusaders have, like, you know, a decent... People are all right with them. Like, you can forge off of our land. You can make camp here. Like, it's all good. You know, go go give those Ottomans what for. Um, and they're, they're not disciplined. They're not a professional army at all. So they're, they start pissing off locals. Anyway... Peter the Hermit marches them into Ottoman territory, and I can't remember who the sultan at the time was, but he's like, wait, like, that's, that's the army? That's the, that's their whole crusade? (laughs) Just wipes them all out immediately. Just wipes them off the face of the earth. I think Peter the Hermit actually survived. Did he survive? They thought they had God on their side. Yeah, and they just had, like, some dude named Peter. (laughs) Peter the Hermit. Yeah. Uh, It looks like later life, yeah. Yeah, he survived. He survived that shit. Fucking guy made it back. He got everybody killed. And then lost he lost a lot of good men out there. He really <laughs> did. Like a lot of like dumb peasants. And so when the first crusade actually started, the like, you know, when the professional boys like made their way there, first of all, people were pissed off because they're like, Well, I thought you guys I thought you were crusading and like this army's a lot bigger and like now I, I don't really want you to use my land or forage off of my stuff. Um but the sultan at the time is like, oh, well, it's another one of those crusades. Okay, mm. this is going to be fine. And then they run into a real army. And then suddenly the first crusade is on. But it's Peter the Hermit that started it off just because he was like, we're going down. Get a bag Getting of apples. Some scalps. Let's mm-hmm. go. <laughs> yeah, you got a shovel you can use as a sword or something? Like, let's, let's get crusading, boys. <laughs> he oh was just a God. guy. <laughs> So you're bringing this up, though, in the context of the religious power that took hold out of Italy in this case. The power of story. That is now, if you're going to, and I don't mean this literally for the way we look at the map today, but for Europe's sake and, you know, just south of Europe, we're separating east and west. Yes. And 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 so this guy leads the first, like the unofficial first crusade, whatever, people die. Mm -hmm. In the meantime, the Ottoman Empire has, I'll put that map back in the corner of the screen, this is where they are. They're Mm -hmm. controlling basically a backward sea of this entire land. Yeah, they've they've kicked out the the Christians from Jerusalem. They have the area. But again, there's that, that area in the Balkans where it's constant traffic between the east and the west right Mm. and that is where you have not only the development of all of these different cultural microclimates but you also have like the repositories of so much history and conflict because at some point like people just stay in their area you have a mixing of different people groups you have Croats, bulgarians um bosnians like you have all of these different religions and belief structures that are a checkerboard and then when the empire falls who am i right i mean this is a really good question that i think everybody should ask themselves like if your country dissolves tomorrow like what are you and and a lot of people have experienced this like millions and millions Around of people yeah, yeah. have experienced yeah. this um and fortunately we have never once experienced the complete collapse of our nation but i think it's a good thought experiment to run every once in a while like who am i if i'm not an american what would i call myself if america just disappeared into the ocean um it's so it's such a radical concept because we have no understanding of that that you can't wrap your head around it and i think if you're not a part of a generation that experienced that or rebuilt a country or built a new country perhaps even you can't understand it unless it's incredibly well passed down which there are some cultures that do that you know if you listen to like netanyahu Mm. talk about israel i mean first of all that guy you say what you want about him he's a student of history for sure but he talks about it like it was all yesterday like, I, he talks about them being kicked out, like, fucking 1,300 years ago. Like, and so we were kicked out, and we left the country. This is solid now. And yeah, we went, that was pretty good, right? Really he's, good, yeah. He's yeah. from Philly, though, yeah. so there's a little there you go. So we left the country, and suddenly we were, it was like being kicked out of our apartment. Yeah. And if you're kicked out of your apartment, 
well, one day you go back and it's still your apartment. And so we came back and there was no such thing as Palestine. It was, it was not real. Right now I'm just like hearing, hearing like all the war drums and uh, <laughs> like, it, you but know, simple, it. simple explanations have launched so many missiles yeah. over, <sighs> over simplifying, right? That's a bar, bro. Oversimplifying a situation is paving the way towards military wow. incursion i'm not and listen from my perspective especially for that conflict no. i'm not trying to judge yeah like i i study that a lot and mm. i understand i understand both sides and i think there's both wrong on both sides there's reactions that happen but when you hear a guy like that talk about this stuff he is talking about it not from like a my grandfather my great grand like my fucking you can't even map them on a page ancestor because this shit is bi it's quite literally biblical yeah right yeah and so they come back and and they're able to to get back on their land and by the way do what we talked about with all these other countries that you know are or all these other people who don't have a state like the kurds mm. and stuff like that the the jewish people got their state back they mm. were stateless people yep. for centuries and centuries and centuries and and you think about it it's like Man, oh man, oh man, There's there are some people who can build it in, but to go back to the original point, like with us, we don't, we don't get that. We don't imagine, like, have you ever seen the show, man, uh, The Man in the High Castle? No, but I heard it's great, and I love Philip K. Dick. Yeah, so Philip yeah. K. Dick, legendary author, sci-fi author, who was really on to some shit. Dude, dude was next level. Yeah. He's, he's one of my, I, I used to write science fiction, and, and he was of one of my. Of course you did. What haven't you done? Christ. <laughs> so he, Sports. <laughs> he wrote, he was so ahead of his time, that guy, but yeah. they made a show that I will now say was a little bit ahead of its time. It was 2015 to 2019. It was on Amazon Prime. It was four seasons. It's very good called The Man in the High Castle, which was one of his stories that he wrote. And the concept is simple. We the lost. Year, the year is 1964. It's the United States. We lost the war. Everything east of the Rockies is run by Nazi Germany. Everything west of the Rockies is run by the Japanese Empire. And the, the central premise is that there are certain characters within there who can tap into alternate realities right and those realities exist across multiverses of other universes and they can see tapes where the allies won the war right and all the while the not i mean a straight nazi like trying to take over the world shit so it's like very fun plot wise but like the nazis are developing technology that allows them to travel through the multiverse as future humans into or into other realities to be able to make sure that they win and things like that yeah and like time warfare when you watch this because the, you know the show's taking place in new york and there's a goddamn nazi flag right flying right, over right. new york like yeah I, listen well every time i see that i feel a certain type of way even Word. though it's a show yeah yeah and and you think about like you are one really bad decision away fucking with the wrong place from something like that yeah yeah well, I, and it, Philip K. Dick too was uh, like he was. I, I feel like he was. He became even as he lost his mind. He was. He was obsessed with this idea of multiple concurrent realities. Yes. Have you ever heard of uh, the, his book Valis? No. Valis is interesting. It's a. Um, it is the book that he wrote while he was actively losing his mind. Uh, hmm. Philip K. Dick. Do we know what officially happened to him in losing his mind? Was there a health on it, like, like a health term? That we have I can tell you from his perspective what he felt had happened. Um, the The story goes that he was did uh, Did he kill himself? I can't remember. He died. He died in 1982. Let's go to his death. Let's just make this easy. Death. On February 17, 1982, after completing an interview, Dick contacted his therapist, complaining of failing eyesight, was advised to go to the hospital immediately, but did not. The following day, he was found unconscious on the floor of a Santa Ana, California home, yeah. having suffered a stroke. On February 25, 1982, Dick suffered another stroke in the hospital, which led to brain death. Five days later, he was disconnected from life support. And he yeah. So he, when he, he was actively sort of entering the psychosis, uh, psychosis stage, he was... Um, Presumably, and this is right before he wrote Valis, um, he uh, uh, was, I think he had got, had like oral surgery or something like that. Anyway, he had a, a toothache and he was waiting on a prescription uh, to come to his apartment. 
somebody drops off this prescription in his apartment and uh, he sees that uh, she has the uh, uh, like sort of Christian fish uh, around her uh, her neck. At this point, from what I understand, he feels that a beam sort of hits him in his sort of third eye center and conveys to him that there's like all of these multiple realities going on at the same time. And Valis is written sort of from his point of view as he's like almost like bifurcating mm. into different. Whoa. Yeah, different realities. And one of the things that he consistently says, so he calls himself um, horse lover fat in that um in that book like he that's the the name that he gives himself which i guess is like some reference to his like english name um but one of the things that he consistently says in the book is the uh you know the empire never ended the roman empire never ended the roman empire never ended it's constantly this 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 refrain in the book mm. and then there's another philip k dick short story that i think is creepy as fuck um I mean, it's it's chilling. It's it's because it's a goofy concept, but it like is so perfectly done. Basically, you have this woman who uh, is able to travel into these alternate dimensions, mm. um, and she's sort of a war profiteer. So in the dimension that it, she's going to, there's all of this money just hundreds of thousands of dollars just strewn on the like it's worthless now because this the state has collapsed but of course it's worth a lot in the dimension that she's from and so she brings them you know various things that they need enough food to sort of survive but what she doesn't realize is that the people on the other side in this universe where they have all this useless cash that she wants is they're building a machine of their own in order to break out of their uh, their um, uh, their uh, dimension and into a better dimension where they're not, you know, starving and and dying. Um, and then when she finds out that they're trying to break out of their dimension, mind you, she still wants all of the like useless money to them. She takes an action to circumvent them from making their machine that will allow them to travel into a better universe so it's a chilling story Fuck. of basically like multi-dimensional war profiteering um what if that's happening right now i mean it could be in some ways it is like in there are there are people who are you know i mean you can you can look at it as simple as uh you know the the uh, the fruit wars in South America, like people, people starting wars over, over making sure that like, uh, companies like Dole can sell like the fruit from South America. Like that's, that's profiteering. Absolutely. Right. I mean, that's, that's the great thing about Philip K. Dick is like, yeah, he's taking us to a, a universe that's just diagonal to our own. Like it's so close that it it's almost like it, it it's so close to our own that it's chilling. Um, I I the way that I I feel like Philip K. Dick for me is like I'll I'll take a couple of his his like short stories as vitamins. Um, just because <laughs> it's like <laughs> I I don't necessarily enjoy the reading, but the concepts in it are so powerful yeah. that it gives you a way of reconceptualizing what's going on around us there's even this one that's super goofy i think it's called like the swizzle <laughs> like i think the literally and and it, it's it almost is this sort uh, of the schismogenesis issue that we were talking about like um so he maybe can write swizzle <laughs> but i think it's called swizzle I don't know. anyway keep going. anyway so the the idea is that um uh there's this sort of like interdimensional salesman and um he comes and he's he's repairing a swizzle and the the like he gets to a house and like she's like I, I think this is the wrong door and he's like oh man My I, bad. I i got into the wrong dimension it's fine and then she's like wait what's a swizzle and he's like oh well the world is largely divided divided into like two types of people people who have swizzles and people who don't have swizzles so you should probably have a swizzle and she's like well i don't think i want one what does it do and he's like well i can't tell you that <laughs> and it's like I mean, if that isn't isn't like you know the perfect example of schismogenesis of of like 
arbitrarily dividing human yes. beings for the purpose of generating power or 100%. economic enfranchisement like that's that's the the perverse incentive that that propels warfare. This was this was a great tangent on what we were doing. We just went on like a good <laughs> yeah. I don't know, forty we, minute. Tangent. I, I think we went from the Ottoman Empire to Philip K. Dick to to owls. Yes, no, that was good. I love. <laughs> that's why I love doing this job. You mm-hmm. never know where it's going to go. Yeah. But back to the original point. The reason we were on the Ottomans was because it had to do with the Balkans and the formation. Yeah. And we went through the Crusades. Oh, and I got all a, that. I got a good Balkan thing too. All right, go uh, for it. The, the sandwich heard around the world. Uh, the potential sandwich. The sandwich. It's a good question. How do you hear a sandwich? Well, it's it's Are you chewing too loud. This is a uh, this is a, a a question that that historians have actually asked about or have uh-huh. written about. So the uh, uh, World War One starts uh, when uh, Archduke Franz Ferdinand of the Austro-Hungarian Empire is murdered by the Black Hand, who are a Serbian nationalist group in Sarajevo. I can't remember the year. Anyway. He gets shot by a guy named... 1914, I think. Sounds like it could be. Yeah, Sounds right. Check Um, me in the comments. Yeah, check him in the comments. But don't look up the owl fact, because that's fucking awesome. Impress impress your friends at bars with that. Good one. So good. Um, So, Gavrilo Prinkip is the the trigger man. And he kills uh, Archduke Franz Ferdinand. This tips off World War I. Um, uh, it's like the the shot heard around the world, basically, except you know, not not the American Revolution. Um, that is how it started. But if you descend into the specifics about the story of how Archduke Franz Ferdinand was shot, it becomes way more fascinating. Mm. Um, and and the it, the basic level of this is that. Um, Gavrilo Prinkip uh, was walking out of a coffee shop or like a little delicatessen at the time. And some people believe that he was eating a sandwich and and historians have, have argued whether or not he was eating a sandwich or not. If you, yeah, if you, uh, uh, wow, he was, Archduke Franz Ferdinand was not a good looking guy. No. Yeah. Mustache was strong though. Uh, yeah. It's a strong Absolutely, mustache. man. Um, so people argue whether or not he like had a sandwich in his hand when he was like about to shoot Archduke Franz Ferdinand. But I think the more important part of this is it shows how uh, history oftentimes the most important parts of history are not these devised moves, but in fact, it's that that whole it's stumbling into yes. changing the world. So when Archduke's friend Franz Ferdinand comes to Sarajevo, Sarajevo is a sort of notoriously long city. It goes along this river. I can't remember the river's name. Um, but he's touring the city and he's saying, hey, you're all part of the Austro-Hungarian Empire now. Black Hand is really not about this. And they're like, we're going to kill this guy. Um, and they are, you know, not going to underdo it. So they take, I think it's something like 19 assassins, and they're all spread out along the parade route. And the first assassin... Princip, and just to be clear, just so we don't get body bagged here, it was Princip and the five other conspirators. It wasn't 19. Oh, thank you. Sorry thank to you. fact check. No, it, no, I appreciate it. I just want to yeah. make sure we get it right. Yeah. But it's a lot of people. That's no, a lot yeah. of people. Yeah, so it was, uh, uh, maybe they arrested 19 in, in total with... Anyway, um... But yeah, so there were all these other assassins that were along the uh, the route that were trying to take out Archduke Franz Ferdinand. First time that somebody uh, tries to take him out, they throw a grenade at him and it bounces off the car and like blows up the car in back of him. Anyway, they scrub the parade and they're like, well, we, we're not doing this anymore. Um, and, it, you know. Franz Ferdinand is still a politician, so he's like, it's a good idea for me to go to the magistrate and be like, that was really messed up. Let's not have that happen again. Mm. Now I'm going to go visit the, um, you know, the wounded. And so his driver takes him around. He realizes he's gotten lost um, and he's stuck on this bridge. He's trying to back up and, you know, it's a, it's a pre-World War One car, so it's not not doing so hot. Now... The other assassins that were along the route, they disbanded, but Gavrilo Prinkep went to go get a sandwich, presumably. Mm. Nobody nobody actually knows, and there's there's actually been papers written on what he was doing in that coffee shop, but the, the legend goes that he was eating a sandwich in a coffee shop. 
which I think you can still go to in Sarajevo. I'm actually headed to Sarajevo uh, next two weeks, so I'll send you a picture of it. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, yeah. Um, so through no fault of his own, through this twist of fate, he walks out of the coffee shop at the exact same time as Archduke Franz Ferdinand is stalled on a bridge in a topless car. And Prinkip has the gun in his pocket. Mm. And so even though they scrubbed the parade, even though it didn't go according to plan, he has one chance to stand there and kill the guy that his bosses want him to kill. And he pulls the trigger and the world modern world. Changes. Yep. Because he randomly went to that coffee shop and he randomly had that gun on him. In another multiverse, though. He missed. The card moved and he missed. Yeah. And nothing had. Hitler's probably an artist somewhere. got accepted into school. You know? I wonder what would have happened. I mean, there. so there's the the... The I've heard one reading of it that you know the the that Gavrilo didn't matter that this was a this was a war that was going to happen anyway because you have two empires expanding yeah, into something was going to happen right and it, and it's expanding into the Balkans right you know one of the reasons that I think it's it's unfortunate that people don't know more about the Balkans is because they it's not settled history yet you know i was talking i talked with one guy in the book about um uh, a serbian serbian guy who's like the docent at the the monastery grashnitsa and um you know he's a little bit frosty to me in the beginning but then we start talking and um i'm like you know do you think that serbia will take over this area again do you think that the borders of Serbia will will include Gracenica again? And he was like, "Oh yeah, absolutely." Wait a second, am I mixed up? Gracenica is where? Gracenica is a Serbian enclave in the center of Kosovo. Got it. Got it. Yeah. Got it. Okay. Yeah. I should have said that. So yeah, it's a Serbian enclave in the center of Kosovo, and I was. That's where like the seven percent of the people who are in Kosovo who are Serbian are mostly. It's there. It's Mitrovica. It's that's on the north end, right? Mm -hmm. yep. Yeah, and there are little villages here and there. Um, and so you know, he and I are are, and I mean, like the the scene. Sometimes, like reality, really just hands you some some great shit. Oh sure. Because like the scene just kind of like wrote itself. I was I was going to this monastery because it's a protected Serbian monastery, and I'm just trying to get the Serb point of view on things. Walk in on the the wall is painted the last judgment so like on one side it's like you know sinners being tortured mm. and on the other side it's like you know yeah. uh, everybody in heaven and this this docent troyan he comes up and he's like where are you from and i i normally would say los angeles just because it kind of you know it's not like i'm from the usa serbian guy um and uh, he's like okay and then he's pretty frosty to me and I'm trying to make conversation. It's like I think he might be a good person to chat with. And I'm like, hey, who's um, who's this one saint in the in the picture of of paradise, right? And he's like, do you know your Bible? And I was like, I mean, decent enough from Catholic school. And he's like, well, there was a thief that was crucified next to Christ. And I was like, ah, Saint Dismas. My buddy Dave took it as his confirmation name. Otherwise, I would wait. That guy became a saint. Yeah, dude. The robber to the. Um, there was one that that didn't that denied him. Yep. Uh, that said, the other one was like, yeah. "We should be here, you know. You'll be on my right he's hand like, in yeah, paradise I'll today." Be paradise. Yeah, 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 word. Yeah, so that's Saint Dismas, and so he's a bit. Shout impressed. out Mel Gibson. <laughs> Shout out Saint Dismas. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, anyway, Troyan was like, uh, he was like, okay, this guy, this guy can hang with his Bible facts, and we started ta chatting for a bit, and I was like, you know. From your perspective, do you think that Serbia will retake Gracenica? That you're just holding on to this monastery, helping protect this monastery until it becomes part of Serbia again? And he's like, "Oh yeah, definitely." We're when was this conversation? A couple weeks ago. No, a couple months ago. Maybe mm. two, three months ago. Um, and he was like, "We're at what I would call halftime." in the football match it's not over and i mean 
the guy is visibly upset as he's telling me this. He's not just a, a propaganda spouting machine. He genuinely wants Serbia to retake this area. And he genuinely believes it. Again, that... It's that in the right dead center of Kosovo, bro. Yeah, it's dude. not even like on the border or something. No, nah, it's man. even on the right side, on the east side. Yeah, dude. And he thinks Serbia is going to come into the dead center of Kosovo and take just this area. Yep. He talk- no, no, he thinks he thinks that it's all, all going to be Kosovo. Yeah. See, that doesn't I know I'm an outsider here that makes no sense. These are all Albanians here. There's these little enclaves of Serbs. I don't know why they feel like this is their land. None of their people are there. It's like us saying, like, oh, Mexico's ours. What? Well, think about the generators of belief that are there. I mean, because that's more important, I think, than than the than the reality of the population, right? You have this monastery. This You have Gracenica. You've got the site of the Battle of Kosovo. Imagine, uh, which is Gazemistan, which is, like, um, I don't know, maybe an hour away from from this this site. I'll put the map in the yeah. corner of the you, screen. So you have can see these it. deeply, deeply important cultural touchstones for the Serbian national story there. And those are important generators of of nationalism. They're important generators of the story of of Serbia and the 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 story of Kosovo. So it, I mean, at least for Gazemistan, it's almost like if Gettysburg was in Cuba, right? Yeah, but it's way longer ago, dude. <laughs> you're right. It is way, way long. longer ago. But, I mean, just like what you're talking about with, with Netanyahu, yeah. it doesn't yeah, matter. Not, yeah. It, 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 like, when, it, when we... But his, but Netanyahu, they, a lot of Jews were there. Yeah, right. They're not here. They're in one little spot, mm-hmm. another little spot somewhere else. There's such a small percentage of this. Yeah, I don't understand it. I think that the the way the way that I've kind of squared the circle with this for me, and again, like you know, I mean, the only way that I can really talk about it is like in these sort of like magical terms. It's like at a certain point to create a nation, you have to weld a story to the land. And one of the best ways to like absolutely make that story as undeniable as the color of the sky is to have somebody die on that land. It could Mm. be a soldier that fell for a cause, or it could be somebody who died of old age and made a family that thrived there. But when somebody calling themselves a Serb, somebody calling themselves an Albanian, somebody calling themselves a Russian or an American dies on that land, suddenly the story is married to that land. And that is very, very hard to change, especially hard to change without violence. I agree. Because then when more violence happens on that land, it's a battle of two stories, right? It's and crazy how the world is. I know. Well, because it has everything to do with your own individual identity. Yes. Like, and and you you people don't think about their identities as something they'll fight to the death for until it's threatened, until part of it is threatened, right? I, I mean, but but you so you're talking with this guy in the bar. He's mm, Serbian in that monastery. In the I'm sorry, in the yeah. monastery. That's far <laughs> from a bar, but. I kept on picturing this in a bar. So I I, I went, go to a bar right after it. I have a chapter called "A Big Glass Penis Full of Booze." Oh, nice. Yeah, All right. I won't even ask on that. Yeah, don't. But, you should read read the book. Read but, the book. You can read about the big glass penis full of booze. This guy's Serbian, though. Yeah. Are you speaking English to him? English, yeah. Okay, because mm-hmm. you don't speak Serb, but you speak Albanian. You speak Albanian. Yeah. Okay. So, when you went to this country, though, you already spoke Albanian because you had been in Tirana from. 2011 to 2013 and learned it. I right? had been in Trapoya, so I, that was like my, my, Trapoya, my Peace Corps right. village. You're in Toronto yeah. now, but mm-hmm. both in Albania. So you, you spoke Albanian. Yeah. Kosovars, which Beck Lover claims there is no such thing. They're just Albanians. <laughs> Beck Lover claims Al- a lot of things. Albanians speak Albanian. Yeah, they and, and they specifically Duh. speak uh, a dialect called Gegrisht in, um, in Kosovo and Northern Albania. So like I, I learned northern albanian dialect what would you say that's like british versus american english type deal uh more like um uh deep mississippi south versus 
uh, versus like um, New York, highly educated New York fancy talk. Yeah, God. like so the northern dialect is a lot rougher and it's a lot um, it's a lot older. It takes uh, the the southern dialect is is called Tosk. And it's taken some more um, Italian words, uh, Turkish words. Um, they sound a bit different. Um, and sometimes they're not intelligible with one another. There's a lot of dialects in Albanian. Um, well, the, to focus on Kosovo, though, which yeah. is a landlocked country. It doesn't yep. have a high GDP. Its nope. population is, what, a few million? Mm, not even. Like 1.5, yeah, something like yeah. that. Yeah, so it's not that big. And it's shrinking. Shrink it. Why mm. is it? Oh, because they're People want to leave. Yeah. Right. So, but some of the people leave for Albania. No? Mm, At least I, some. I, I think that's that's definitely possible. I don't hear about it often. Because um, there's like a dream to unite those countries as one, which a lot of people in the EU have an issue with. Some people think that way. Some people think, um, I mean, I really couldn't speak for Kosovars or Albanians on this. I've heard both sides Got i've it. heard people say that's a ridiculous idea i've heard other people say one day greater albania will be a thing again which mm. is you know it's another future tense that people are promising themselves just like trojan is saying that that um you know eventually serbia will take over the monastery of gracinica again mm. um and then he also says, you know, like we're we're heading for this battle of good and evil, and you need to like figure out which side. That's you're what people say, man. I'm no. hearing that in the U.S. now. This is how people. I hear it a lot. This is how people other everyone else. They say we're good, and the opposite is all evil. Yeah. It's everything or nothing. Yeah, and yeah. it's wrong. You know. It's now totally... look, is it not? Is it wrong when you're looking at Nazi Germany? No. Mm -hmm. But that's what people do. They try to equivocate everything to Nazi Germany, which also I think is a... delegitimize is the the sheer evil that that was i think it's just you know now when someone calls someone hitler it doesn't even mean anything of course not yeah it, which is so wrong but you know look, looking at looking at kosovo here I, I read a great book about a year ago maybe a little over a year ago by elliot Be elliot behar mm. who it was called tell it to the world and he was, I believe, a Canadian prosecutor in The Hague uh, who prosecuted war crimes against Serbian leaders during the ethnic cleansing and genocide yeah. in Kosovo right. of Albanians. Mm -hmm. And look, any genocide is awful and, you know, I, I don't want to differentiate them. But, yeah. you know, when you read about it, it's it's horrific. Yeah. And I would I would highly recommend the book to people, but he talks about what happened, and this is not long ago. This is in 1998, 1999. Beck Lever lost 28 family members in this. Mm. So, you know, th this, this is something that is, is fresh to a lot of people. And when you see that these Serbians came in to what they viewed as their land, to all these foreign people who have occupied that land for forever, mm. and you see what they did to them. The idea, like, as, because again, you said something in our previous episode that's brilliant. Our enemies are governments, not people, mm -mm. right? So I'm not blaming all, it's not like all the Serbian people stood for this or whatever, yeah. but it's, it feels very, it feels lacking self awareness to me mm. when a Serbian who may live within that nation says something like this. Yeah. When this just happened to these people, now look, were there responses from the KLA, the Kosovo Liberation Army that, you know, did some things against Serbians? Yeah. Yes. But mm -hmm. again, it's like a response to what was happening because their land was invaded in this post-Yugoslavian time by these Serbs who was claiming it was theirs. And I'm not dignifying some of the things like potential organ harvesting and stuff right, that right. happened, which was bad, which is being prosecuted in The Hague, by right, the way. Right. Th Thatchic, mm. or whatever his name is, the mm. former president who was... A KLA gender, right? Or gender <laughs> commando. Mm -hmm. You know, he is in, I believe he's at The Hague right now and is being prosecuted potentially for what allegedly happened there. But, like, how could you, when you know what happened and how this had to end with NATO bombing Milosevic, the Serbian leader, basically for 70 out, days out of fucking Kosovo? Yep. Like, the fact that not all countries even recognize Kosovo now. And the fact that Serbians within there, both things, are like, no, no, we're going to go take this. And Serbians outside of it are like, no, no, that's Serbia. We're going to go take it. Normal people, not hateful people or anything. Yeah. I don't understand it. Like, what, like, how do you, outside of that conversation you've already laid out with that guy, like, 
how do how do Kosovars look at this and and how how much lacking of nuance is there when you talk to Serbians about I think this? I think that this is well it, it depends on on who you talk to certainly but I think that this is the important like the the important thing to think about is is this that whole right right to a future tense thing right if you don't have a reasonable right to uh, you know a reasonable understanding that your future is going to be better than your current situation it's very easy to get you to believe a fiction that promises you that so troyan is clearly unhappy with his situation in uh uh as the the docent of of gracchanitsa he's more than willing to believe in a story even if it doesn't bear a lot of relationship to what the on the ground reality is he's more than happy to believe a story that guarantees him a future that's better than his present mm. and i i think that that's a, that's a trap that we can all fall into yes and i don't at all believe like i think he's a totally rational person i i you know um i understand the at least as much as i can the cultural context that he's he's living in um and I also know that that I'm massively biased towards the point of view that that I'm specifically connected with. You know, I'm an American that lives in Albania, speaks Albanian, um, and have worked for the Albanian people for a long time. And also, you know, uh, America led the the NATO bombing campaign. So yeah. I have plenty of reasons to agree with their point of view, but. A lot of the work that you have to do if you're writing something like this specifically, which is radioactive in certain circles. Your um, book. Yeah, absolutely. Because of some of the countries you're like recognizing. And I stuff. mean, I say the word Kosovo and and, you and know, that's it's radioactive like, in certain God, circles, yeah. just to say. It. Oh, my God. Somaliland. It's on Google same. Maps. I know. Well, look at, look at it on Google Maps. Kosovo? It's right there. It's dotted line. Oh, fuck. Yep. Oh wait, is this the thing where it's recognized on Apple but not on Google? Sometimes depends. That's it actually it depends on what country you're into, which is wild. But also not to like swing around the big dick of America or whatever, but like America recognizes Kosovo. Yep, like Russia doesn't, but mm -hmm. many of the European countries do. You need to have an enormous amount of violence. Uh, uh, you need to have an enormous capability to do violence if you're going to create a country. And you need to have the recognition of other countries that have the capability of enacting violence. Mm -hmm. I mean, ultimately, that that really is the idea. Lieberland is a weird case, right? Yeah. Think about this whole concept of you know the um, the story being welded to the land in some respect. It's no man's land. Nobody was living there. There was no story there, right? So there are and there are no resources there. So, because of that, Bitcoin millionaire can ride a jet ski up, park his thing, and <laughs> and you Got know, a goddamn country, Buckaroo. Let's let's get some let's get some embassy set up. Oh, remember that from South Park. Buckle up, Buckaroo. <laughs> <laughs> it's been a while. Kate, I need to listen. Caitlyn Jenner just plowing over people. In I the need car. to listen to or to to watch <laughs> uh, South Park more often. That's a wonderful show. Yeah, you'd be a good South Park character for sure. Thanks, you man. Fit right in. Thanks, man. Yeah. I appreciate it. I mean that in all the best ways. Yeah, no, I take it. I didn't I say you were going to be like Randy Marsh. Absolutely. Hey, man. Much respect to Randy. What I love Randy Marsh. Pure-hearted yeah. individual. Oh. You could say that. <laughs> Something like that. Enormous testicles. That one episode. Yeah. Oh. But it's it's fascinating that you were that you've been there and and now you're in Albania. Yeah. Which is a definitely similar culture, different vibe. Yeah. Right. Very much so. Yep. I love. I love. Um, spending time in Kosovo. Uh, I, I how often do you go there these days? Maybe once every six months or so. And how easy is it? It's it's very easy to cross the border. Obviously, it, there's no border it's, anymore. It's like kind of the same thing. Yeah, it's like two hours. Oh, there's no border. There's no, no they arbitrary don't, border. They, they don't they don't stop you anymore. Um, because it's all there. See, Shipri Mod. Yeah, there. What? How do they say that? Uh, Shipria Moth is Greater Albania. Yeah, yeah. They, they. At some point, they stopped. They stopped like, like you know, the official border checks. Um, I remember Dua Lipa put out a tweet a couple years ago. It was like summer. I want to say it was summer of 2021. 
do a leap of the world famous pop star for people who actually haven't proud, heard her proud, song. Sometime. Proud Kosovar. Proud Kosovar. Wow. And she's interesting because she lived her life growing up between the two countries. Yeah. She was born in Britain as yep. a child of like, you know, her parents Refugees. left there basically yeah. and went back mm-hmm. and was the student when Kosovo formed as a country, ended up coming back to Britain to then get her career, but she's a proud Kosovar yeah. and everything. And she put out a tweet with the Albanian map, the Albanian flag, which by the way is the coolest Dopest flag, flag in the world. It's so fucking cool. Dopest like that flag. thing, like I want that flag. Yeah, I know. It's I know. great. I would when, I would wear that on everything I own. When I saw that was my Peace Corps country, I was like, fuck yeah. Because yeah. they just threw a dart at a map. I could have yeah. been, they could have thrown me anywhere. I'll put the flag in the corner of the screen so people can see it's it. But like that's cool why looking. they all do the eagle yeah. symbol like this. It's very, very cool. But she put out a, a tweet. I can put the tweet in the corner of the screen as well that she got a lot of shit for. I'm sure she did. Where it had, I believe if I remember correctly, the point is going to be correct though. She had like the map of greater Albania with the flag over right. it that included Kosovo. Right, right, right. Or, right. or Kosovo. And people flipped the fuck out. Now a lot of Albanians liked it, but people were like, oh, this is like a hardcore nationalism or whatever. Mm-hmm. And she had to do like damage control on this, so it is a radioactive dude. I story trying to be made. <laughs> I mean, I like the. I have this literally. My first, my first bit of this is uh, like it's called covering my tush because <laughs> it, it, you have to like you have to a- attack it head on, and it's like you know. Uh, so the the sentences are like. I understood at the outset of writing this book that talking about unrecognized country has the potential to make me more enemies than friends. One person's burgeoning nation state is oftentimes another's rogue den of terrorists. Mm. That was certainly the case when a group of violent revolutionaries met in secret to start what is now known as the United States. Ideology gives ways to words, which catalyze action that leads to violence, and eventually another line is drawn on a very crowded map. Mm. Right? Interesting. So I... I knew that I and I was I was prepared to to have these conversations um which you know float in in uh in between goofy cryptocurrency uh jet ski and uh that's another genocide you yes. know um both exist in the same place literally quite literally and I mean look Liberland is also in the Balkans man <laughs> and that's why people get that's why people get charged about it though. And like, you know, I'm I'm a fan of Dua. Like yeah. she she's great and she has she actually has a fucking amazing podcast and a very, very smart girl. Do it Lipa like, does? Yeah. Oh, that's dope. It's actually like really good, dude. Fucking cool, like, man. I listen to it. It's ah. like my liberal podcast. I try to have like a conservative podcast yeah, and yeah. a liberal podcast because I'm in no man's land no, myself. I get you. So I she's get like you. my liberal podcast. Yeah. That's but, why I like listening to you and Danny's because it's like, it's like, like let's It's hear, everything. Yeah. Right? Let's, let's Love hear that. some. And, and I like how every once in a while it's just like, there's just somebody who's like, like, I don't know. My, maybe I'm that guest where it's just like, yeah. This guy's batshit insane. Let's yeah, go. Yeah. Yeah, let's I, let's I like hear. That. I love People have I love nuance, it. man. We bring. Yeah. I don't get lost in that. We bring the world to our there's, table. There's you know? wisdom in it, and and if they are able to articulate their ideas in a way that that makes you think, well, you know, maybe I did discount this idea. Yes. For far too long, because here's this totally reasonable person saying something that I've discounted as hogwash. Even though I haven't spent much time yes, thinking about it, exactly. I mean, look, one of the, the most freeing things that I ever heard is that, like, I don't try and change anybody's opinion unless they ask me to. Great way to look at life, man. Yes. You don't have to. Yeah, I I always say on this show, and I'll say it till I'm blue in the face. Mm-hmm. I won't get tired of saying this. I'm a podcaster. <laughs> if you are a fan of this show, I'm so honored by that. And I and I appreciate it so much. I always, I engage with as many possible fans as I can because it blows my mind that like, people support this thing. It, it, that will just, I'm honored by that. Right. But if you are agreeing with everything I say because you like me, you got to stop doing that. Yeah. I change my opinions like I change my underwear. When I'm presented with better evidence, I fucking change. Yeah. I don't have a leg to stand on on certain things. Even once in a while, if I might get passionate about something, maybe I don't have a leg to stand on with it. Yeah. And you need to be, and I'm a human. I'm wrong. Yeah. 
You need to be open to that. I get worried about, you know, people, not just podcasters, but anyone with like platforms without their intention forming opinion cults. Mm. I think that's a huge problem. And by the way, it's not the fault in, in most cases of, of the people who are at the top end of that. They're yeah, just, they talking just have, and they have the biggest bandwidth. And a lot of fans, their hearts are in the right place. They just get so, they feel like, you know, the creator they like is someone who really speaks to them in a yeah. way, which is a beautiful thing, but it can get you in that unitary mindset of, therefore, I must agree with what this guy says. And please don't do that. Don't agree. And I, we don't have a problem with this, but like, don't agree with guests yeah. and, and shit they say. Like, continue to disagree with guests. Agree with guests. Like, you shouldn't do everything or nothing. And once again, you should have nuance. You should have both. And you shouldn't you shouldn't get so upset when something like doesn't jive with you. Yeah. You know? It's like we we're, were talking earlier about the, uh, the the Jordan Peterson thing, too. It's like, I like a lot of the things that he said. Like, I, I think yeah, we're talking I think, off cam on that. Yeah, yeah. I think some of the stuff is, is decent. I also think that some is completely completely neutral and inoffensive off the rocker yeah. and then some i'm like you missed the mark entirely you crazy old coot yeah it's like it sort of descends into you know old man yells at cloud yeah for people who obviously everyone listening who wasn't in our car conversation yeah, on that the way right. i brought that up to you was you know, I think Jordan is a victim. What's that SG thing called again, that term? Schismogenesis. Schismogenesis. Yeah. I think Jordan is a prime example of that. And I, I don't want to rip Jordan. I, I think there's a lot of good that he still does for people. But, you know, I don't, I stay away from him on social media. I I was never, like, I listened to him on podcasts when he would go on, usually yeah. like Joe Rogan. I, I can't say I was like one of the guys who went and listened to all his speeches and stuff. So... There's less I know than the people who are big fans. And I, I, again, I don't want to rip people too much. I just think Jordan Peterson had so many scumbags attack him for nothing and yeah. for things that he wasn't to the point that in some ways he has taken on some of those things, some of those, you know, more very hardcore yelling at you opinions yeah. that maybe he didn't once have because he got so much abuse. And I empathize with that a lot. I don't, I don't want to sit here and like, overjudge the guy or whatever but yeah like is his twitter brutal yes it is like i i, I like i'm like you need to get off twitter i look Word. at the guy i'm like stop <laughs> yeah dude stop yeah. i don't even follow him on twitter i know i hit not interested and it still, it still show up in up. my feed yeah and it's like dude go touch grass that's exactly right Christ. yeah man. you know and it's and it's just I hate to see that happen with people. Well, I think when, when people become acolytes of anything, it means they need to have more stuff to think about. Yes. Oh my god. Because you can't you can't just export your independent thought to somebody else to do it for you. Yes. You've got to, you know, put in the the intellectual labor to figure out how and why you think about the things that you yes. think about. And it's, I mean, the thing, the thing that is great about it is that you at least can walk back why you think something. Yeah. Um, and that's, that's a, a solid level of introspection. Um, and it, it sort of steals you from, from being, um, you know, being manipulated by, by trash ideas. Um, but, the other problem with it is the difficulty is you may never feel like you have your feet on any sort of solid philosophical mm. yeah. ground. And that, that is, I think a, a good deal of life is, is, you know, the information is continuing to come at you. Um, the world is changing on a consistent basis. Yes. You can, it, I think it's, it's great to have, principles that continue to work in across many different environments um but also to have a healthy way of challenging what those principles are is is and what you believe is is absolutely critical you are a smart motherfucker and you're well you're very well spoken and and you're a great communicator and i'm sure like when i read your book like i'm gonna see that in your writing oh thanks but man I, I wanted to get to the we this has been a marathon podcast. I know it. Yeah. I don't know yet. I'm just thinking this in my head and this might be like obviously not happening if people are listening right now, but 
I might put out the second one first. Or maybe I won't. We'll, we'll figure it out. It's been a wild... I think we've been talking for over six hours. We I'll have probably, been, we, yeah. have a, we have a Patreon episode yeah. in there do, somewhere. Do, but, I would do the first one first, um, because yeah, at we'll, least it... I'll talk with you I about mean, it. I mean, you know how to do we'll, it. We'll, we'll talk about this off. All right, but, cool. But I wanted to talk with you about the city on the edge of Moldova and Ukraine yeah. that has Russians guarding it or some shit. Yeah, yeah. So, so where, when were you there, and what is this? Uh, so in between um, uh, Kosovo and Liberland, I was in Transnistria. How do you spell that? T R A N S N I S T R I. Transnistria. Got it. Okay. I'll, I'll put the map in the corner of the screen. So when uh, you, you were there, when again? So directly. 2018? Yeah, it would 2019? have been 2018. 2018. Okay. Um, so it'd be, it was right after I was in um, uh, Kosovo. So I saw the 10-year anniversary of Kosovo. And then, you know, since I was kind of rearranging my year on the fly since Kurdistan was out, um, I was like, well, I'll find some events that are happening in all of these places and and maybe that'll be a good way to organize um you know uh, organize my year and so 10 year anniversary in kosovo that you know m definitely was a great thing to organize my uh my journey there around and then uh there were russian elections happening in transnistria russian elections yup for local officials no for vladimir putin son of a bitch so they're having pirate elections in a place that is an unrecognized country that is only recognized by other unrecognized countries. I know we're getting into like turtles all, all the yeah, way yeah. down territory here, but that's what it is. Yeah. So there are all these, I think they even have like a, a, a name for what their organization is, but I can't remember what it is right now. So Transnistria is recognized by a place called Ossetia, or pardon me, South Ossetia, a place called Artsakh. And one called Abkhazia. And these are all these Russian satellite statelets that are nominally protected by Russia. And they're all around the Black Sea. Um, and they have, they they operate as, as sort of like um, uh, pseudo states that are under, mm -hmm. under the Russian sphere. Um, so Transnistria, uh, basically Yugoslavia, or pardon me, not Yugoslavia, uh, the, 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 uh, the USSR. <laughs> That's what it was. Um, so the USSR falls. And, um, you know, that process, as I, as I was writing about, I was revisiting, you know, the history of it. And it's like, the process is fascinating because it happens so quickly, right? Mm -hmm. It's, you know, it's a matter of, you know, a couple of years where the, uh, and then, I mean, basically like 1991, 1990, 1991, you have the Russian satellite states just being like, no, we're not, we're not doing this anymore. We're, we're gonna, we're gonna denationalize these things. We're going to, so, um, yeah, and, and revolutions are sort of shrugging off this centralized control of, of flagging communism, um, and then you have the independent republics within the USSR who are chafing at the, the chains of the USSR. So it's like within a couple months, it's like Latvia, Estonia, mm. um, Moldova, Azerbaijan. They're all saying, no, 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 we want national govern governments. We don't want this top-down thing. So over here in Moldova, we have this place called Transnistria. It's also known as, well, so it's known as Prednistrovia or the Republic Prednistrovian Moldovsky, something like that. Um, I don't speak Russian or Moldovan. Um, but this area of land was originally settled by Catherine the Great. Um, and it's important because it's, in, uh, it's important because it's interesting. So it's important because <laughs> um, Catherine the Great was seen as a, um, uh, sort of enlightenment era leader for uh, Russia, right? She was bringing these new enlightenment values for like um, non-hierarchical, big public works. Um, Russia is now a part of Europe. We need to bring Russia into the status of being this great European nation. And we also need to expand our borders. Expanding the borders meant going down into the Black Sea area. So in order to get down into the Black Sea, they needed to take a river called the Dniester River. Mm. 
Transnistria means like across the Dniester River. That's where it gets its name. And so she had to specifically Russianize the area because who was there beforehand was our friends, the Ottoman Empire. So her general, Alexander Sovorov, goes down there to do some conquesting, kick these Ottomans out of this river that goes into the Black Sea. And suddenly she has this sort of like mashup of, of different ethnicities and identities that are down there. But she needs to turn this area into a Russian place. And so how do we do, how do we create a country on land again? We have to marry the story to the land and usually that happens through warfare or it happens with generations living and dying on that land so she moves russians down to that area um uh, along the river on both sides of the river capital city there is called tiraspol um it is a sort of hub for artisans who are working in wood and also cognac vinters uh because you know black sea is sort of known for wine production cognac making uh and so to this day, some of the best cognac that you can get is comes from the Kvint Cognac Factory in, in Tiraspol, Transnistria. Um, it's pretty good. And, it, and this is a total strange sidebar, but it just bears saying because it's so strange. They have a baseball museum in the basement of their cognac factory because they love baseball. Because mm. the Cubans taught them baseball during the time of the USSR. Son of a bitch. Fucking weird, right? Yeah. So here's the other weird part about this. Catherine the Great, not Russian. Mm, that's a problem. Ger- no, it wasn't. German an- uh, she had German ancestry, born in sh- or lived in Stetten, Poland, took the name Catherine. Her name was originally Sophie. So it's like you look at this idea of nationalism, then you realize how squishy the concept that's actually what I'm saying. is. It's problematic for how it ties together, that's but they right. just they went with the legend, I guess, of it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I didn't listen. I I didn't know that Catherine the Great wasn't Russian until I started working on this book. Um, there you go. But it just it just goes to show you how the story is oftentimes more important than the reality. Yes. Because it's whatever Narrative. Yep, whatever galvanizes a people together. So, you have this Russian area um ages, you know, uh, generations of Russians living on the, along this river, people who are calling themselves Russians, I should say. Um on the other side you have Moldova, um on the uh, on the other other side you have Ukrainians all different identities and ethnicities. You also have some Turkish folks that are in there too. Um, they're in a place called Gagauzia, which is is also a sort of unrecognized nation, but I won't touch on Gagauzia. <laughs> We're going to leave Gagauzia out of this. <laughs> God damn it. <laughs> so anyway, um, then the Soviet Union, Bolshevik Revolution, 1917, I want to say. Um, yep. Bolshevik Revolution Sorry, kicks Nicholas off. Nicholas and his whole family killed. Yep. So I've got, uh, like, the, the imperative is... I have to generate a single identity out of all of these people, right? So you're you're a part of the USSR, even though part of your identity is Moldovan, part of you is Russian, part of you is whatever. And so the Russian identity was the strongest in Transnistria uh, because that's that's where you know Catherine the Great originally pushed the borders off to, and also it, there was a great war story because they pushed the Ottomans away. And this is fine until the USSR falls. Mm. And again, it goes back to that question. What are you if your country goes away? Are you from New Jersey? Like, at least for them, they're like, no, 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 we're still Russian. We're still, we're still doing this thing. So, because we're not Moldovan and we're not Ukrainian and we're going to fight for our own self-determined borders. And how big is this area again? Uh, Landmass wise, I don't know, but it's about 500,000 people. So it's very small. Size, but it's sizable, it's not, you're not talking a Libra land. Well, and they also have an army. Um, their own. They have their own army, but they are, but their borders are protected by Russian regular troops. Because they're not in a recognized country. They're, Ru- they're, Russia they're... doesn't even recognize them, which makes it even crazier. But are they Russia? Not really, no. So are they Moldova? No, not really. So are they Ukrainian? No, definitely not. No, they are they are just they're Transnistria. They're an autonomous but they're not 
they're not a part of they they have a the the region has a sort of co-working agreement with Moldova so their companies in order to do business internationally have to be run this is going to get a lot weirder real fast Ooh. so their companies have to do business with Moldova in order to operate internationally so how does that work from a governmental point of view well the country is largely run by oligarchs and of course the is. most important company i would say is a grocery store brand that is a sort of de facto government there because they run so many of the institutions and own so much of the stuff what brand it's called sheriff of course it is yep look it up is it spelled like sheriff yep <laughs> come on yeah sheriff is trans that, is that a russian word no it's called Sheriff. Sheriff Transnistria. There you go. The fuck? God damn it. Sheriff Star. Oh my god. So I've you heard... You cannot make this shit up. I know. <laughs> so they own everything in Transnistria. Like they own everything. And it's like there's you, Sheriff Gas Station, Sheriff supermarket chain i mean honestly it's a pretty good supermarket chain and i've never seen a place where you can get a liter of vodka for 20 cents but you can get it there um uh sheriff i, I think i even saw a sheriff yoga studio the share like the official football team that i support is sheriff fc they have their own football team what league i have no idea some european league they actually did pretty well from what i remember uh this last year um, but some European league. They have a whole stadium. That's FC the... Sheriff Tri Tiraspol? Yep, that's it. What are they in? The first league, 88-89. What league does it... Superliga? Who's in that? The Moldovan Super... So they're in the Moldova Superliga. So they... I guess they... Someone there can possibly qualify for, like, Champions League. I, I think so, yeah. So, I mean, so you're you're sort of surrounded by sheriff at all times while you're there and then there's other like main businesses but it's how long were you here six weeks maybe longer too long how much did <laughs> too, why too too long, long way too long um why so i was uh i was staying at a really rough hostel um and it was just a very uncomfortable place um and there was this dude who is a American white supremacist that was living there. Huh. He was living in the hostel too. I call him Dave the white supremacist in the book. Um, nice. Yeah. And well, so there are there are other things that I, I've I've heard, but I can't I, I can't like act, absolutely say are true. I have heard that there are there are servers that that run, um, let's say, spicier internet content out of Transnistria for this would be the place to do it well because there's no extradition yeah. from the fbi so sometimes oh sometimes uh, uh transnistria is known as the 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 black hole of europe because if you want to go there and just be anonymous you can be um yeah it's a fascinating place um and it's in that area it's in towards that eastern block area where it's just fucking yeah it's two hours shit show two hours one hour two hours away from odessa by train um two Dang, hours so away close. from kishi now um well, and the people there did you you felt they viewed themselves as kind of russian yeah that was that was my understanding so there were these two guys shout out to vladimir and victor um <laughs> good good dudes man i don't know to this day if they were like following me but i think they were Oh I I don't know if they're a secret police or something. Um, I've never I never confirmed. You know it. how many flow charts you're probably on around the world, uh, <laughs> intelligence wise. <laughs> like I'm a connector between like yeah. Vladimir and Victor and like Yoshi from Link the CIA's <laughs> most comedic asset. <laughs> That's right. This Eric Zuliger character. So you're being talked about in the Kremlin. I'd be super cool if I was. <laughs> I'm, I, I, Kremlin, anybody? I'm 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 clearly. Not opposed to doing any work. Um, oh, even for the Kremlin, you are just. I shouldn't say that. No, yeah, I'm you shouldn't to say that. For the Kremlin, um, it's not uh, a good look right now. We don't, we don't it like isn't, the Kremlin it right isn't, now. It isn't good look. They're, yeah. they're very not good. So, uh, okay, so I, um, uh, I, y y 
you get followed in Transnistria, um, in Tiraspol. And um, I was, I lost my camera. Uh, like the, the you know, I, I bought a nice camera before I left. I lost it. And I, I know that it was on this number three bus. It's a tiny town. I was like, okay, well, all I have to do is go to the central bus station, wait for all of the number threes to come through. I'll eventually find the driver that had my camera. And, you know, I'm not doing anything else that day. I'm just looking for my damn camera because I spent a lot of money on it. And it was like the most valuable thing I owned at the time. So, um, I, I, you know, it was like my second day in Tiraspol. And so I get out and um, I think I'm on the right bus. And then I realize I'm not. I'm going the wrong direction. And so, like, no big deal. I'll just get out of the next bus, bus station across the street. But I realize that there are these two dudes behind me. And uh, I'm like, oh, okay, well whatever, they must have gotten on the wrong bus too. So I get out and cross the street and these two dudes are still behind me. And I was like, okay, well, it's weird they're still behind me, but we'll, I mean, I'm not doing anything. Um, You're not scared? No, no, they, they seem, they're, you know, they, they don't, they're not a, an, impose, a, an imposing presence, okay. certainly. Um, go all the way to the central bus station. And I'm just sitting on the, the bench there at the central bus station, I'm waiting for all the number threes to cycle through. Now, meanwhile, every other bus is cycling through, and my two guys are just, like, hanging out on the bench in back of me. I'm like, well, clearly they're not going anywhere because I've seen every single bus cycle through. I'm just waiting for the right number three bus mm. to come because I'll recognize the the bus guy. Anyway, I, um, I go on to each bus, and I'm like, hey, camera? <laughs> yeah, uh, where where is it? Um, and you know, everybody you know tells me yet, and and I go sit on my bench again. <laughs> like this is all I'm doing all day. And finally, all the all the buses go through, and I'm like, well, this is this is weird. For, first of all, it's weird because they're not going anywhere. Like what? Like if you're following me, I'm not doing anything. I'm just a weird guy doing weird shit. And I get that that's strange, but like I'm kind of over being followed right now. So it's like. Look, if you are, like, genuinely curious about me or if you're working for the state or whatever, you probably speak English. So I'm just going to, like, go up to you. And you balls of steel motherfucker. Nothing to lose. I mean, literally nothing to lose. I was like, hey, do you speak English? And then <laughs> Vladimir got busted. <laughs> I, was like, I was like, yes. Um, yeah, a little. And I'm like, oh, okay, cool. So I um, <laughs> I lost my camera, and I wonder if maybe you know where it is. I was on this bus uh, yesterday, and I, I lost my camera. And then, like, he was like, I, Victor doesn't speak English. And he was like, you said something, Victor. And then he was like, you know, I think I heard about that camera. Yeah, I think it's... I think it's on uh, VK, which is like a, a Russian, the Russian version of Facebook. And he, lo and behold, opens up VK and there's a picture of my camera on the number three bus. And he's like, is this it? And I'm like, yeah, that's my camera. Weird that you knew about it. Yeah, and totally just not a spook. happened to be here. And then I was like, yes, I find it for you. <laughs> well, I was like, you know, can you help me find it? And he's like, oh, of course I can. You know, you well, come with me. So, uh, well, I kind of invited myself along. So, so. <sighs> They were like, they were like, um, so, uh, they were like, look, you know, the, the thing isn't, he's not driving anymore today. You're looking for a guy named, um, oh, was it a, uh, uh, I don't know, his, his name's in the book. Anyway, a very Russian name. Um, and he's like, you're looking for a driver named this. You have to come back tomorrow and, and then maybe you'll find him. And, well, you will find him because <laughs> there's only one driver who's doing this. Um, and I'm like, okay, cool. And then he's like, so what will you do now? I'm like, I don't. I don't have any other plans other than just look for my camera. And now I can't do anything until the morning. And then I'm like, what are you guys doing? And then they're like, well, we're going to go make lunch. Do you want to come? <laughs> I was like, yeah, of course okay, I I'll do. Get some lunch. <laughs> Absolutely. So I like went over to, to Vladimir and Victor's apartment and we just like had lunch and watched opera videos on YouTube for hours. Was great and that was it 
Yeah. No, we we watched Opera Forever, and then uh, they uh, they they inject you with anything. No, no, you they were get chipped up. I I ended up going back because they were like, we gotta we gotta teach you how to make Mama Liga, and I'm like, what's Mama Liga? And he's like, oh, it's like don't worry, about tra- it. Transnistrian dish. Yeah. So yeah, we I just like I don't know. They like they certainly seemed that they were following me, but ended up making Mama Liga with them, uh, and that shit's delicious. And then how long after the Mama Liga did you leave the country or zone? Mm, I probably had about another week or two there. I saw them a couple of times. Uh, yeah, but I, you know, then you just have other weird shit where you just see the same people over and mm. over again in different like circumstances well there like, you go yeah like at one point i was, I was in sheriff um and uh i was at the pickle counter and all these people just like entered the sheriff at the mm-hmm. same time not good and i was like that's weird because they were all just like around just the pickle counter but like nobody was like buying anything they were it's all almost just... like once you go in there you're like truman in the Truman Show. That's exactly what it feels like. That's exactly yeah. what it feels like. You're never far away from somebody who knows exactly where you just were. And that Yo. might just be small town vibes no. or it might be totalitarian state no. vibes. Yes. So I was like, you know, I, you know, in the midst of all of these people, like, you know, just doing random stuff that didn't look like it belonged in a grocery store. Like they, it looked like they were fake looking at groceries right. or whatever. And I was, I thought to myself, well, I'm just going to go to a random row and that I don't need anything in. And I'm just going to see if they gravitate towards where I am. Mm. And so I just like went to a random place in the the store. And then lo and behold, people just start coming over. It's super weird. Really, really strange place. But then I went to this, um, this punk rock show. Um, I don't, I don't remember who told me about it, but like some, somebody who I'd, I'd made friends with was like, yeah, come to this, this, it's like this basement, um, underground punk rock show. And it went like, w- went the hardest until like 9 PM sharp. And then everybody just turned on the lights and went home. Really? Yeah. Like it was it's such, bizarre. such a, very not punk of them. Super not punk. But at the same time, there was like, you know, people with like, body mods and like you know full full black like eye contacts in like one dude was just like cutting himself and like getting all gg allen on it and then as soon as nine o'clock came around just wow what a weird place what's it like do you have you heard anything about what it's like right now given the outbreak of the war i'm curious about it i i i should ask victor um uh, I, I, he and I missed calls with, with each other a couple of times. Um, uh, pardon me, Vladimir, um, Victor doesn't speak English. Cause their um, location's odd. Cause it's on, you know, it's still close to ship, but it's on the other side. Oh. Like my friend, Nick Kifiak, who was episode 55 on this show, who owns unbelievable sneaker store up in couple, a couple of them up in North Jersey, like yeah. the high end kind of shit, yeah, yeah. an online store too. But he, he's Moldovan ah. and I was talking to him months ago now. Well, he would know a lot about Transnistria. Well, I didn't talk to him about that because I didn't know about that. But, like, Moldova's even in a weird spot there. Super. You know, because it's like, oh, how's this going to go? Eastern side of the country is is very uh, Russian-oriented. One of the thoughts when when Transnistria, again, sort of schismogenesis, one of the concerns for the Transnistrians or Prednistrovians, depending on how you want to, what name you want to call them by, um, was that Moldova would link up with greater Romania mm. and because they speak an interoperable language. And in fact, there's even a Moldovan. Oh, my God. Yeah, there's a Moldovan, um, like, portion of Romania. It's called Moldavia, right? So, a, a, like, perfect example of this. So, like, I walk out of Transnistria. Because I'm, I'm transiting through to, I think maybe I was going back to school. Because, like, I was doing uh, Oxford um, as a part-time student. And then uh, So I'd leave Transnistria and go to Oxford. Um, Vladimir and Victor had given me this ribbon um, to wear. And, and um, he, they were like, I'm like, what's this ribbon? They're like, oh, it's like the Russian Russian thing. Like, you know, it's it's our thing. I'm like, okay, cool. That's That's very kind of you. And, it, and, you know, for, for the viewers who know, it's like a, a gray and orange ribbon, which is specifically a ribbon that is like 
in support of the Russian military. Mm. So I just like have this thing randomly on my on my lapel or whatever, and I get off of the the bus in Kiji now, and as soon as I get off the bus, like somebody like just beelines towards me from the market that they drop you off in grabs me by the arm and is like, you know, yelling at me in Moldovan, like, what's this? What's this? And mm. I was like, I don't know. It's a ribbon. And then somebody comes over and explains, he's like, that's a, that's a Russian thing. You don't, you don't have that here. Ooh. Take that off. And I was like, okay. My oh. bad. <laughs> yeah. Whoa, man. I had no clue. Um, but I mean, I even, I, I talk about that in the book a bit where it's like, you know, real, real politics don't happen when you go and and tick a box for who you want your leader to be real politics happens when you you put on a hat or when you put on a ribbon uh or when you buy extra food at the grocery store because prices are going up and you don't understand why real politics happens when you like don't talk about something that you care about mm -hmm. real politics happen when you talk about something that you have no idea about but you're you're deeply passionate about it because you're animated by something that you saw and real politics happen when you can't sleep at night because you think that somebody who has more power than you is doing something with your money that you don't agree with but you have to get up in the morning because you have to go to work and real politics happens like when your money is worth so much less than it once was and you yes. don't understand why that is the case. So like the things that hit you at home from a economic personal beliefs or communication standpoint. Yep. To yep. break that all down and and p put it in the base terms, that's politics. Well, You're I mean, right. think about it. Like you could we have we have an election coming up soon and it's I, I i hear the i hear the the war drums of it already That's and it's brutal. it's and every nobody wants it no but it's also like this you know it's this circus right this yeah. this this it's exactly what it is it's this entertainment circus now presumably because there are all these things that are not politics that are completely immaterial, but they're just they're just talking, right? Because they're they're playing the game. Yes. And part of the game involves your your eyes and your ears and your mind. Now, presumably, I think that if I was in a coma right now, tomorrow I go into a coma and I wake up from my coma the day before voting. And I'm like, well, I have to vote. I could probably do a decent rundown of who the candidates are and feel mm. feel like uh, and figure out where I feel I land and who represents my point of view. Fine, without a year and a half of this oh, yeah. opera. Yep, that it's drama. It really is. But that's that's the thing. We've we've conflated entertainment with governance. Yeah, yeah, it's that ship has sailed, my friend. Oh, there's nowhere where, you know in France that they they're only allowed to have like two week election cycles, something like that. See, I and I don't. That's not the answer either. But at the same time, I'm jealous of that. I but it's still people still drag politics during their term that becomes yeah. about the next election. Well, I think it's this crazy. is also like the the perverse incentive thing. So while I was working in, um, I I after being the ambassador, I started working in the cryptocurrency industry as like a writer. <laughs> Um, is a small industry and, uh, and I needed a job and, and oh a lot of the stuff is, is passively interesting enough. Like that isn't like, you know, uh, all this sort of like moon boy, like to the moon shit. Like that's, that's pretty, that can be, be taxing to listen to. Um, but there is really interesting concepts in it. And like one of them is this concept of liquid democracy. Mm. And this is, um, it's a governance system that, that uses, uh, blockchain to, um, basically turn your vote into a digital good, right? So think about how oh, different, oof. well, think about how different the, the election cycle would be if you could withdraw your vote from a candidate. Dude. Right? So It's weird, though. It does. 
gets real weird. I'm going to make it even weirder now. What happens if you can delegate your voting power to somebody else that you think knows more about a particular issue? Like, say there's, you know... Um, nah, yeah, I'm out on that. Yeah? No, nope, that's a slippery slope. Not going to touch that. <laughs> I'm so out on that. Yeah, I'm not an official stance of, of the... Dude, you're going to break my brain if we go into that. Yeah, we probably should. <laughs> we should probably call Listen, it, man. Eric, this has been a pleasure. This is the last podcast we're ever recording in this studio, which is trippy. Barn burner, man. I basically lived here for three and a half years. But I... I got two episodes and a Patreon episode somewhere in there out of this. We went for like six and a half or seven hours. Fuck, isn't that long? This just barely beat the record of the longest recording I ever did in one sitting. Completely unplanned, but dude, you have lived a crazy life. Your book is (laughs) You Are Not Here. The link is in the description. Everyone should go check this out. I've not read it yet, but if it communicates anything like this guy does, this is going to be done in about six hours. Enjoy, guys. Fucking awesome. Thanks, man. Listen, brother. Thank you so much. Thanks for being the last one here. Absolutely. And it's an honor. Everybody else, you know what it is. Give it a thought. Get back to me. See you in motherfucking Hoboken. Peace. Thank you so much for watching this episode, everybody. Before you leave, please smash that subscribe button, hit that like button, and also, if you'd like, check out another episode from the show by clicking right here.